Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome back to the second day of this workshop. Uh, I apologize for a little bit of a late start. We, uh, for those of you who are in person, you understand. For those online, we had um, some hiccups with traffic and uh, getting food and speakers in on time. So uh, we're, we're back on track now. Uh, we have some opening remarks from our other co-chair, uh, Talkjip or TJ Ha. Uh, and then we're going to launch right into our first session. So, um, TJ. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Tech Jipa. I go by TJ from Johns Hopkins University. Uh, I'm a co chair of uh, this committee uh, together with uh, uh, Brenda Bass uh, from Utah. And I'd like to thank. Uh, all of the staff members of the National Academies uh, for organizing uh, and supporting uh, this exciting event. Can you, uh... oh, okay, so there's a, so we had a really uh, wonderful, uh, series of uh, sessions yesterday, ending uh, in the session uh, titled Major Concerns and Pitfalls in, in the Field. And I would say there is about a discussion on the scientific need uh, uh, for the, uh, you know, uh, the sequencing and mapping of uh, RNA modifications. Today, we will start uh, with a session uh, focused on more on the societal need for uh, an effort, uh, focusing on uh, impacts on uh, biotechnologies and disease. And uh, the final session of the day and the morning will be on some uh, brand new technologies that we may not even uh, know uh, can be used for mapping RNA modifications, but we believe uh, will uh, become part of the effort uh, uh, in the future. Uh, uh, you know, that technology that may not be ready or mature enough to be applied uh, to uh, problems at the moment, but may become essential. And in between, we'll have a breakout group. Uh, I believe it will be organized among the in-person participants separately and uh, separated for the virtual participants. Um, uh, there will be uh, another activity a few months from now, uh, doing the breakout groups and brainstorming sessions on a larger scale. So for that, we are announcing in public uh, our ideation challenge. And this is about uh, performing a collaborative brainstorming and problem solving um, sessions uh, among uh, teams of scientists and uh, innovators uh, from different background about how to uh, uh, identify and uh, come up with solutions for challenges in the area of mapping and sequencing RNA modifications. Uh, it'll happen in June uh, over a three-day period uh, and the application for identity challenge has just uh, opened up this morning or as of now, and it'll close in April uh, on April 10th. And it may happen fully virtually, or it may happen uh, in a hybrid format uh, with uh, some in-person uh, participants as we are running uh, this workshop uh, uh, yesterday and today. And uh, we invite uh, all of you and other innovators uh, to participate and uh, uh, hopefully we will have uh, people from uh, all different sectors and different backgrounds and also from different career stages uh, uh, including uh, postdocs and graduate students. So uh, I think it provides uh, several uh, 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 interest, interesting and um, and helpful motivations why you want to do this. Um, you'll get an acknowledgement officially uh, for your participation, uh, especially for the younger participants. It can be a nice uh, addition, uh, a one-line addition to your CV. 
and it'll uh, help, you know, give you an opportunity to shape the future research uh, in this space. And it'll be a great networking opportunities for everyone. And, and for some of the ideas that are selected uh, for additional elaboration, uh, the teams will uh, be offered uh, uh, some compensation uh, for writing a commission paper that will become part of the report uh, in one format or another. So uh, please apply. Uh, we have uh, the URL uh, and Q, uh, code here. And uh, this information will be available uh, through email announcements that you will all receive and also um, a project uh, website. And uh, especially, uh, I think it'll be really interesting to uh, to think about encouraging your students and postdocs and uh, in your own labs and other uh, 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 labs in in your institution uh, to to apply. So I uh, ask Catherine uh, to come to the podium to make a, a separate announcement. Hi, everyone. I'm Catherine Aslan. I'm an associate program officer here at the National Academies. Uh, along with staffing uh, this project, I'm also staff on the Committee on Use of Race, Ethnicity, Ancestry, and Ancestry as Population Descriptors in Genomics Research. Um, and so yesterday, our report was released. So as you can see, the report is titled Using Population Descriptors in Genetics and Genomics Research, a new framework for an evolving field. So as you can see up there, there's two QR codes. The first one you can scan to get to our report. Uh, it includes our report, a uh, quick highlights page, a page with all of our recommendations, and then finally an interactive page, which includes an interactive decision tree for uh, genetics and genomics researchers. Um, and I'm sure also RNA researchers, if you use descriptors to decide which descriptors would be best to use uh, for your particular study. So uh, the second QR code there is for our report release briefing, uh, the webinar that we have on Friday. So that's March 17th from 11.30 a.m. to 12.30 p.m. Eastern time. Uh, so you can scan that QR code to register. Um, again, uh, please join us on Friday for a briefing from the co-chairs, as well as time for Q&A from the public um, that will be answered by the co-chairs, as well as um, other a few other members of the committee. Um, so I'll pass it back to TJ to kick off our first session for today. Thanks for your attention. Uh, thank you, Catherine. So, okay. So uh, the next uh, session is um, a session we titled um, uh, Framing the Day. And, and our speaker is Dr. Ecker Jankowski from uh, Moderna. And Dr. Jankowski is the Vice President of RNA Science at Moderna. Uh, previously, he was a professor at Case Western University and the Director of the Center of RNA Science and Therapeutics. So now uh, we are moving on to the next session, uh, the, which will be shared, uh, chaired uh, by um, the Dr. Susan Barsega from Yale University. Uh, she's joining us remotely. Hello, everyone. Thank you, TJ. I'd like to introduce myself. I'm Susan Barsega. I'm a professor of molecular biophysics and biochemistry at Yale University and the Yale School of Medicine. And I'm here to moderate the session on uh, disease and societal impacts of RNA chemical modifications. So our goals are threefold in this session, and that is to understand the information that is known about RNA chemical modifications and how they're connected to disease. We'd like to explore how patient populations are impacted by expanded research on the understanding of disease, especially as it pertains to RNA modifications. And we're interested in the impacts and diagnostics and treatments as end products of this research. We'll have three different speakers today, um, our, our, and, and each will give a five to ten minutes uh, presentation. At the end, we'll have uh, uh, we'll invite everyone to to uh, submit their questions. And for those of you who are online, like I am, 
in the chat, Jessica Dumouy has put in the um, link that you can use to submit your questions. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce Kathy Liu. Kathy is an assistant professor of biochemistry and biophysics at the Perlman School of Medicine at the University of Pennsylvania. Dr. Liu's current research focuses on the co-regulation of modifications across mRNA, tRNA, and ribosomal RNA in cancers, and sex chromosome encoded protein homologs in sex bias of cancers. Kathy? Hey, Susan, thank you for the introduction. I'm here. Yeah. Um, oh, great. Where's my control? Um, hello, everyone in the room and on Zoom. Let's talk about RNA modifications in disease. Um, so like Christine introduced yesterday, both DNA and RNA carry chemical modifications installed by the enzymes. But one thing very unique to RNA is we have so many RNA species and more than 150 types of modifications on RNA. Together with the sequence on RNA, they can significantly diversify gene regulation. Because the modifications, they will move, <laughs> they will Okay, because they will uh, nearly impact every single step of the RNA processing. Today, my goal is to use the three major RNA species to tell you the modifications function, dysregulation, to set up the stage for Phil and Dylan to tell you more about the RNA modifications in disease. I'd like to start with the tRNA because this is the most heavily modified RNA species. As you see here, all the yellow squares are highlighted disease-relevant tRNA modifications. I call them the disease-relevant tRNA modifications is because the enzymes that modify those signs has been implicated in human disease. In general, the modifications stay in the anti-codon loop region. They could modify the uh, fidelity of translation, speed of translation, with the modification on the DRM, TRM region of the TRM molecules, they could modulate the conformation and the stability of the molecules. Let me show you some specific examples. The first example is the elongator complex, which is a six member protein uh, complex that add this uh, carboxy methyl group on your cell. Two other enzymes could further modify the structure. This modification occurs at the 34th position in your cell in tRNA, the anti-codon loop region wobble site. It will enhance translation of codons that ending with adenosine, so AAA, CAA, GAA to promote codon-dependent uh, translation. Elongator complex uh, is uh, required for normal development. However, it can be hijacked by cancers. For instance, in melanoma, elongator complex uh, elevated level of that has been implicated in patients, which to promote uh, HIP-1 alpha expression, which is enriched of those codons. HIP-1 alpha is a hypoxia inducible factor one alpha, important transcription factor to promote cell proliferation under hypoxia, often seen in cancer. This type of a codon specific translation has been implicated to promote uh, uh, specific protein oncogenes in different types of cancers. Another example I'd like to share is the Trimten A, which installed a single uh, methylation on the ninth position in the D loop of tRNA. So the patient has a nonsense uh, mutation in Trimten lead to enzyme decay. The patient have uh, uh, intellectual disability also present on young onside diabetic syndrome. If you look at the expression level of trimtin enriched in the brain islet, so meshes really well with the disease phenotype. So in 2020, this group I have identified there are more than 10 uh, tRNA that are modified by trimtin A. And 
missing trim turn A, the mod and the modification will lead to the confirmation and stability alteration of TRA initial methane that could tune down translation. In the same year, my group identified trim turn A could interact with mRNA modifying enzymes to actually coordinate the methylations across RNA species to tune down translation. Because the patients show a down regulation of trim turn A, so whether the disease phenotype is really because of the canonical uh, modification here uh, could from other alternative mechanisms is still not entirely known. I'd like to switch my gear to ribosome RNA modifications. So it's, the modifications are mostly included uh, during this uh, complicated, concerted, and clinical important biological event, ribosome biogenesis. So after transcription, ribosome RNA is after, uh, uh, undergo a lot of processing and all way built into the mature ribosome for translation. Both the small subunit uh, ribosome RNA, ATS ribosome RNA, and the large subunit ribosome RNAs uh, all carry uh, chemical modifications. Today, I'd like to draw your attention to the four enzymes that modify the ATS uh, ribosome RNA because Unlike the enzymes are modified based in the large subunit, these four enzymes are absolutely essential. No cell can survive through knockout this uh, four enzymes that modify the base of the small subunit ribosome RNA. They have been implicated in different types of disease. Uh, for instance, EMG1, the methyltransferase, has been implicated in bovine cardini syndrome, which is a rare genetic disorder that can lead to devastating consequences. Most of the patients will not survive through infancy. So the whole exome sequencing suggests that EMG1 carries uh, aspartic uh, 86 to glycine mutation in this conserved aspartic uh, 86 site. This mutation will lead to a demerization decay of EMG1. Uh, EMG1 has two roles. Catalytically, it modifies at the single methylation in this complex structure in ATS ribosome RNA, but non-catalytically, it participates in ATS uh, processing and small subunit assembly because the patients show low level of EMG1. So whether the disease is because of the methylation in ribosome RNA or because of defects in small subunit assembly. So the second modification on ribosome, this is what we know is more about the modification. So this complex uh, modifies the uh, two primal methyl in ribosome RNA. The methylations are required for the translation of internal ribosome entrance site transcripts that are important for hematopoiesis. Without the methylation, this group of mRNA, the translation will be tuned down to inhibit the hematopoiesis that has been implicated in different types of uh, leukemia. One last thing is about our uh, mRNA modification. I, yesterday we talked about pseudo user, today is on M6A. Uh, M6A in mRNA was first uh, discovered in 1974, 1975. For a while, we think this is a static modification. Uh, until uh, early 2010, the discovery of the uh, demethylase enzymes has shown uh, M6A is under this reversible regulation. Uh, the antibody was available in 1987, but uh, until 2012, uh, two groups identified the transcriptome-wide location of M6A using antibody-assisted approaches. So how M6A perform the biological function because of the reader proteins. The reader proteins have a higher affinity to the methylated than the unmethylated transcripts to influence the splicing nuclear nucleus to cytoplasmal translocation, enhance translation and decay. Apparently, this is an oversimplified model, but this is one of the earliest generic models uh, show the how the reader proteins evacuate the biological function. Later on, there are more reader proteins discovered and the different types of mechanisms proposed. This is a rapidly growing field with more things to be discovered. Uh, MATTL3, the M6A methyl transferase, have been implicated in many types of uh, uh, malignancy, making it attractive drug targets. Indeed, scientists went ahead and uh, discovered uh, developed the inhibitors. They could inhibit MATTL3's methyl transfer activity with a pretty good IC50. 
They have tested the efficacy of the uh, inhibitors in patient-derived AML models and AML xenograft. Um, actually, this particular inhibitor already um, been FDA approved and entered trial one. Let's see how soon it could enter the market to start to help patients. I'd like to end my part by posting a few questions that I and my group are thinking about and for the committee to, to consider. Uh, so for the tRNA and the ribosome RNA modifications, because of years of study, we know better than the MR modification about their occupancy in the given site and the precise location. However, when we talk about those modifying enzymes in disease, are we really talking about the modifications or the enzyme by itself? So I think in the future studies, we could consider more of using the catalytical inactive variants to rescue the phenotype to see how much is actually coming from the modifications. For the mRNA side, uh, at least for M6A, we know it's more about the modification itself. What we need to improve is the single nucleotide sequ uh, resolution mapping and also the occupancy at the given site so to quantitatively detect that. I will be really curious about how much the methylation in the given site will be tuned up and down to give a, a phenotype or to give a pathological impact. Another thing, I think it's a time to start to push this angle, the coordination of modifications across RNA species. So these three major species support translation with the modification on them concurrently. So why are the modifications in messenger RNA, ribosome RNA, and tRNA could synergistically impact uh, uh, translation. So my group started to see some exciting evidence. We show the enzymes that could physically interact with each other to influence and coordinate the methylations in different RNA species. In a more direct case, we observed the synergy between the tRNA anti-codon loop region and M6A to promote translation. One last thing is RNA modification as a tool for disease diagnosis and uh, uh, and treatment. Is the M1 pseudo U the only one, the best one for this purpose? Or we could harness the power of a different RNA modifications or, or even in a combinatorial way to uh, treat the disease. Oh, uh, yes. <laughs> I'd like, like to thank my group and uh, your attention. Thank you, Kathy. That was very informative. We're going to move on to Dylan Simon um, and take questions at the end. So uh, uh, Dylan Simon currently serves as the Director of Policy for the Every Life Foundation for Rare Diseases. Since joining the Every Life Foundation, he has focused on newborn screening and diagnostic policy issues, as well as annual appropriations efforts for the rare disease community. We'd like to welcome Dylan. Perfect. Uh, thank you all for having me. Um, as you heard, I am policy. I am not the science person. Uh, so I'm here to talk about uh, the impact on the rare disease community, speaking from a high level in terms of how this research can impact the community as a whole. Uh, so first, I want to talk a little bit about the organization, just so a little more about me uh, and where I come from. Uh, so the Everlife Foundation is a DC-based nonprofit, nonpartisan organization that's focused on empowering the rare disease patient community to advocate for impactful science-driven legislation. Uh, really, at the end of the day, we're looking for how can we advance equitable development of and access to life-saving diagnoses, treatments, and cures. And I think it's really important to note. I forgot which way. Good. There we go. Okay. Um, in the last slide, I talked a little bit about how we empower the patients. And so for us, we do a fair amount of advocating on our own, but a, a, at the core part of our foundation is how can we help Speak, uh, patients speak for themselves? How can we ensure the fact that they're out there telling their story, giving their voice, uh, and having the ability to impact advocacy, impact research? Because within rare disease, such a key part of that journey is the fact that you are going from doctor to doctor with people who don't necessarily know exactly what your symptoms mean or what condition you have. And because all these conditions are rare and as well as ultra rare, you, many that they meet with have not even heard of the condition that they have. And so a lot of what we do is making sure that we can empower patients to we can speak for themselves, how can we provide training so that they are aware of how to advocate around policy and issues that are important to them. Uh, a little bit of background on rare diseases themselves, for those who do not know, 
Uh, so there are approximately 10,000 uh, rare diseases within the United States impacting approximately 30 million. Um, you can see there, there's a little conflict in the numbers, which is my apologies, but that is new. Uh, so previously had been 7,000, we're in the process of updating numbers to say 10,000. Uh, and one of the important aspects to highlight is that only 5% of rare diseases have an FDA approved treatment. Um, and so that is really the key part of today's story. Uh, many of those treatments are either enzyme replacement therapies, you have a growing number of gene therapies, uh, 70 to 80% of rare diseases are genetic in origin. Um, but the key part I want to highlight that is because rare disease patients are looking for treatments and cures wherever they can find them. Uh, they can't afford to be picky. Uh, they're quite often looking for how can we manage our symptoms. Uh, a key part within the rare disease community is what is known as patient-focused drug development, uh, ensuring the fact that you're actually talking to the individuals with the rare diseases to understand what treatments and, and what treatments they want and what are the symptoms that they want alleviated. Um, there's a great story I actually heard last week from, a, from an advocate who was discussing how when they were part of a clinical trial, um, a, they were, the clinical trial was listing negative symptoms as a part of potential reasons to not approve a drug. However, they had not spoken to enough of members of that community to realize that those negative symptoms were just a symptom of the rare disease. And so what they were assuming was a negative impact of the potential treatment uh, was actually just the natural history of the rare disease itself. Uh, and so we, there are a fair, fair amount of research in natural history studies to try to uh, ensure that doesn't happen. But it really gets to the, the idea within the rare diseases that how can we ensure the fact that we're getting treatments to patients and the treatments that they need? Um, and it's also, from the economic side, uh, quite important. Because as you can see here, when looking at just 379 of the more than 10,000 rare diseases, uh, the economic burden was almost $1 trillion in 2019 alone. Um, and so what you see here is that when you're looking even at a small number and you cannot generalize across all the rare diseases, that this does have a high prevalence and high economic burden for all rare diseases, for the full healthcare economy. Uh, and you can see here how it's broken down. And you, the first would be direct medical costs. And so here's what we're talking in terms of uh, inpatient visits. Uh, drug pricing, what we think of in terms of medical costs. And within the conversation we're talking about today, um, inpatient visits is what I want to discuss most. And so within that 418 billion that you see there for medical costs, the highest percentage, uh, the, the highest cost within that is inpatient visits. So it's members of the rare disease community having a onset of symptoms that they cannot care for at home. So they have to go to the doctor, they have to go to the ER, they have to get taken care of. Obviously, the theory would be if you can see an increase in treatments, um, that that cost would then come down. Uh, second, when you're looking at productivity loss, uh, and so these are what we call indirect costs. Uh, so that is what happens if uh, the person with the rare disease can no longer work. Uh, in addition, what happens if it is a child uh, and the parent has to also leave the workforce? And so that's where you're looking at productivity losses. Uh, and then the non-medical and uncovered. So what happens if you need to build a, a wheelchair ramp for the home? Uh, aspects like that. And so all of that, we want to get to take the full picture because more often than not, when you're talking about the costs uh, of a rare disease or costs of a disease in general, you're looking at the direct medical costs and they, as you can see, are quite high uh, and and do not need be belittled, but you have to look at the full picture because it is not just um, is not just the cost of visiting a doctor. It's not just the cost of your drugs. It is the cost of making sure that your home works for the rare disease patient. It is it is the cost of, can you still uh, go to work? Can you still, can your parents still go to work? And so we want to look at the full cost. And the reason I want to bring this up is because at the end of the day, rare disease patients, when talking about treatments, just want new treatments. They want access to these ideas. They want access to new clinical trials. There's a, a, a big effort within the community to how can we improve access to clinical trials um, through telehealth. And so it's how do we get this idea of decentralized clinical trials? And so we're talking a lot, obviously, about RNA modifications today. And I think for me, really, the, the key point I want to highlight is that more research is needed. Uh, and within the rare disease community, that's all that anybody really cares about is how can we get this research done, whether it is through natural history studies, whether it is through genetic gene therapies, whether it is through RNA modifications. Uh, and so I want to highlight a couple of stories at the end just to really bring this back to the patients. Uh, and so the story you see here is from Lisa G, who is a rare mom to Samuel, who had, who had a rare blood disorder. Uh, Samuel uh, passed away at the age of two 
Uh, so I'll make sure I get the story correct. So I'm going to read from my notes now. Um, from rare blood disorder known as Langerhans cell histocenia. Um, he was diagnosed at 10 months, uh, which both these stories had early diagnoses, uh, which was which is great. Uh, however, in the rare disease community, um, there's no something known as a diagnostic odyssey. It takes on average 6.3 years uh, from onset of first symptom uh, to official diagnosis. I know we're talking a little bit more about treatments today, um, but I think it's always worth bringing up the diagnostic odyssey because it plays such a large role uh, within the rare disease community. Um, and so Lisa and her, fa and her family spent the next 16 months um, in and out of hospitals, trying a myriad of treatments to try to find what would work for Samuel. Um, unfortunately, none of them worked um, and he passed away at the age of two. And unfortunately in that two years, he was missed out on a lot of the normal aspects of life because he was uh, immunocompromised. Uh, and so when asked what issues were important to her, Lisa highlighted that more research is needed. It wasn't necessarily that I need a specific treatment or I, need, I needed more education or, or I needed better doctors. It was, I need more research. Uh, and you see here that after Samuel passed away, a specific gene was identified uh, that's provided an opportunity to target the disease with a more effective life-saving treatment. So while there's still no cause, she highlights the fact that the more research that occurs and the more funding that is going into this, the better these stories can come out. And so and you can, the reason I want to highlight the story is it wasn't, Lisa doesn't say we need more gene therapy research. Lisa didn't say we need more research into diagnoses. We just need more research. But within the rare disease community, that is so important to talk about, the, the need for rare disease research, also looking at research that covers broad aspects of the rare disease community. Uh, NCATS does fantastic work looking at this as the idea of looking at multiple diseases as a whole. How can you create platform technology that will impact multiple rare diseases or rare disease families as opposed to looking at individual diseases? And so you can see Lisa's quote here on the slide talking about really illuminates that aspect of how we just need that re more research. Um, and so you see at the bottom, a lot of doctors want to research the more common disease because of what it can mean for the career. The rare disease community appears to need more researchers. I think that's such a great point is when doing the research, how can it, understanding how can it impact select rare diseases? And lastly, I want to talk about Nikki S. Uh, Nikki S was a rare mom whose son had TBCK syndrome, which is a rare neurogenetic disorder. Uh, and son was diagnosed at one month uh, with uh, the, again, the TPCK, um, and met with many specialists um, when trying to determine what exactly the condition was. Uh, and she discussed when trying to access a, a therapy, uh, the challenges that surround a therapy for TPCK syndrome was are more associated with a lack of information and research. As TPCK syndrome is so new and research funding remains in early stages, there's only emerging research that supports uh, the use of brand chain amino acids as potential drug therapy to overcome some of the physical challenges patients face. So I want to highlight this for a few reasons. Uh, first is talking about how there is still a lack of information, the need for research such as what we're talking about today to really round out the story, have a better understanding of what exactly is occurring within these rare diseases. Uh, but again, it highlights at the end what I talked about at the beginning in terms of physical challenges patients face. As you can see here, she's not talking about a cure. She's talking about how can I just help to improve some of these challenges that my son is facing. Uh, and so really the goal for today and, and happy to answer questions is really just again highlighting the fact that research like this can have such a huge impact across the full rare disease community that are they're just searching for new treatments and new cures to help alleviate symptoms potentially find some cures but really just have that research to have a better understanding of what their condition is and how's the best way to go about treating it i uh, thank you so much and happy to answer questions thank you thank you dylan we're going to uh, take questions at the end of all three speakers so I'm going to be introducing next Philip Yeski, who's online just like I am. Are you there? You are. I see your I name. Here. <laughs> so I'm so so excited that you're here. Let me introduce you first. Uh, Philip Yeski is the United Mitochondrial Disease Foundation Science and Alliance Officer. Um, that United Mitochondrial Disease Foundation is abbreviated UMDF. Dr. Yeski has been active in the mitochondrial disease community since 2004 first as a parent of an affected child, then as a trustee of the UMDF Foundation from 2010 to 2012. In 2013, he accepted the position of UMDF Science and Alliance Officer, responsible for leading the foundation's research mission and managing all scientific and business development efforts related to improved diagnoses, development of treatments and cures and optimized patient care. So uh, Dr. Yeski, go ahead. 
Uh, that thank you, Susan, and thank you, organizers, for um, inviting me to be a part of uh, the, this workshop. I'm I'm really thrilled to uh, to be here, and you know I'm going to try to build off some of the comments that uh, Dylan just provided, you know, more general around rare disease therapeutic development and some of the case studies he provided. But I'm going to focus on mitochondrial diseases. And as you heard, I have a very personal connection to this. And my first daughter was diagnosed with the mitochondrial disease back in 2004. I'm a synthetic organic chemist, PhD. When they said mitochondrial disease, I had no idea there were diseases of mitochondria. And I suspect many of you uh, may be in the, the same boat. Uh, <clears throat> so I'd like to give a little bit of background on mitochondrial diseases and then talk about how we can develop the patient voice of mitochondrial disease and the role that plays in effective therapeutic development. So, uh, you know, as Dylan said, you know, many of these rare diseases are really collections of ultra rare diseases. So there's a kind of collective prevalence, if you will, for mitochondrial diseases of approximately one in 5,000. That's the best epidemiology we have at this point, maybe even more common than that, but it fits squarely in the rare disease space. Um, in, in very high level terms, these are diseases of energy. Of course, the primary role of mitochondria is to generate the energy that our cells require. Around 90% of the energy is generated through mitochondria and the electron transport chain. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about the genetics of that here just in a second. Um, but to give you an idea, these are diseases that can affect young, can affect old. Adult onset is not uncommon at all. Um, they may be mild, and more um, uh, chronic uh, in, in nature, or they can be severe and all the way towards uh, fatal. So there's this broad spectrum of presentation um, and just in, that encompasses mitochondrial diseases that really touches upon all the demographics inside our, of, of our society. I think importantly, uh, no FDA approved uh, therapies for mitochondrial disease. And that really speaks to the large unmet medical need that I'm going to uh, come back to as I continue. So from a phenotypic point of view, um, because all the major organ systems require energy to function, uh, the, it, it's really uh, can impact a brain, a heart, the lungs, the skeletal system, a muscle system. Um, so uh, you, you see sort of the range of symptoms that can uh, present and have some kind of underlying mitochondrial pathology associated with it. But if we look at the, the genetics, of course, mitochondria are organelles embedded inside the cell. Uh, the proteome of uh, mitochondria is approximately 1,100 unique uh, proteins. Only 13 of those proteins are actually encoded by mitochondrial DNA. So the mitochondria have their own little genome. That was part of what I had to remind myself back in 2004. Uh, but of course, the, the nuclear uh, DNA uh, does the bulk of the work. So we have this symbiotic uh, relationship between the mitochondria, uh, mitochondrial DNA and the nuclear DNA uh, to ensure that uh, the cell works well, has all the energy that it requires. Uh, so with mitochondria, the difference, of course, in the genome is we have many copies of the mitochondria inside of there. So circular um, uh, DNA and mitochondrial DNA, it can be hundreds of copies, thousands of copies in each cell, just depending on the energetic needs of that tissue type. Um, and then whenever we have some kind of uh, insult that takes place, uh, whether it's in the nuclear DNA or the mitochondrial DNA, uh, that can cause aberrations and, and mutations inside of it. And for mitochondrial DNA, because we have so many copies of it inside the cells, um, now you have this concept of heteroplasmy, where only a portion of the DNA is mutated. So the ratio of wild type to uh, mutated is very important because there's typically some kind of pathogenic threshold that has to be crossed there. Uh, but this also affords an opportunity, right, to think about therapeutic challenges and how we get uh, opportunities and approaches, how we can shift the heteroplasmy back to a subpathogenic uh, uh, threshold. 
So in, in summary, it's complicated. When we talk about mitochondrial disease, there's nothing simple about it. Um, really both clinically and genetically, um, a, a complex set of diseases. And this, of course, uh, you know, leads to a challenging uh, diagnostic scenario. And again, Dylan spoke to Diagnostic Odyssey historically. Uh, clinically, patients are seen by doctors. There's some assessment of the phenotype of the symptoms they're showing uh, that may lead to a suspicion clinically of mitochondrial disease. Some blood tests can be done. Uh, historically, biopsies played a large role of just removing a piece of muscle and then looking at the bioenergetics uh, associated with that. And you can see some of the lab work that was done. But over time, genetics has really become the primary way to diagnose these inherited disorders, which totally makes sense. Um, but over time, uh, the, the genetics have advanced to the point now with genetic testing where uh, it, it moved from uh, PCR through to uh, very focused panels. But it was really this, you know, this diagnostic odyssey that, that, it, that, again, Dylan spoke to is very much the case for mitochondrial disease patients. You know, they're seeing a lot of different doctors and 70% are still receiving muscle biopsies. This number is dropping rapidly though. And a major reason for that, of course, was the advent of whole exome sequencing um, in uh, the early 2010 kind of timeframe, uh, which now allows us to look much more broadly across all the proteins uh, associated with mitochondrial disease. And I think with this little chart shows you is there's a lot of different pathways uh, that um, are uh, connected between the nuclear DNA and the mitochondrial DNA, including some transcription translation pathways um, that will bring RNA modification into the question as, well, uh, as a, a possible way to address mitochondrial disease. Um, you know, all of this is uh, uh, you know, a, a huge, more information-rich approach way to get to diagnosis, but it's genetically heterogeneous. Importantly, though, by using whole exome sequencing, now our best estimate is roughly 60% of cases are solved using whole exome sequencing, and another 30% are referred, meaning it wasn't mitochondrial disease, but it was another genetic disorder, and that helps advance the patient's genetic, uh, excuse me, diagnostic odyssey as well. So I just briefly want to focus on neurologic symptoms and give you some example of how we try to develop the patient voice around this subpopulation of mitochondrial disease patients. As you can see, and as I showed on the first slide, a broad range of symptoms that can be associated with the neurological problems from stroke all the way through to ocular problems or hearing problems. Uh, encephalopathy, encephalopathy, encephalopathies are also a really important component of uh, mitochondrial disease as well. When you, when you take all of this in aggregate, major unmet medical need, it will require a multitude of innovative approaches to solve these problems. So mitochondrial disease is not gonna be the silver bullet disease uh, that can be um, uh, cured um, and, and taken away by a single approach. So it's really important that we're looking at this from a lot of different ways. So I'd like to go a little deeper on, on something that Dylan mentioned around patient-focused drug development. And the FDA, uh, deserves a lot of credit for starting the patient-focused drug development effort, again, back in like a 2012-2013 timeframe, where there was a recognition that in addition to the typical um, efficacy and safety data uh, that the FDA may receive from any sponsor, it would be really important to get complementary data from the patients to better understand what's most important to them. Understand the burden of the disease, but also understand what do idealized treatments look like as these NDAs come in. So it's complementary material to be used with that. It was so successful, uh, they, they couldn't fund it all themselves, so they created the externally led patient-focused drug development meeting, uh, which was really the opportunity for organizations like UMDF to partner with the FDA, put a meeting together, invite patients, caregivers, clinicians, and importantly, FDA personnel, so that the agency personnel have the chance to meet and hear these patients 
Um, and it's another perspective as they're reviewing these applications for, for, for therapies. Uh, so UMDF uh, co-hosted uh, this meeting. We called it Energy in Action back in 2019. We did it in Silver Spring, so right in the shadow of FDA. I believe there were almost 50 uh, agency personnel that came and participated, which was really, really great um, it, across a lot of different review uh, divisions, and it, and it really gave them insight into it. Of course, we create a lot of data out of a meeting like this. So it's recorded, it's transcribed. Uh, and we also wrote up a very important report called the Va Voice of the Patient Report. And that summarizes that this is a, a lasting document then that is available publicly uh, for um, industry, scientists, anyone to use to better understand the, uh, the patient voice. And for something as complex as mitochondrial disease, we really had to think about what could we cover in one day. We broke it down into two populations. We first we addressed adults with myopathy, so muscle-based systems, uh, uh, symptoms. Uh, but in the afternoon, we focused on these pediatric patients uh, with neurological symptoms. Lee syndrome is the most common form of pediatric uh, mitochondrial disease. So I'd like to talk about that. That, that neurological uh, component, just a little bit more to give you an idea of what we drew out through discussion, through testimony, through um, panel discussion, uh, you know, understanding the sort of range of symptoms that they're experiencing, and you see a lot of them listed here, really gives you an idea that mitochondrial disease patients are not typically affected in one single way, but rather in a, in a range of, uh, of ways. The actual average has been published as 16 symptoms for a mitochondrial disease patient. This impacts their ability to, to go about their life, their daily living. And so loss in gross motor function and fine motor activities you know, inhibits their ability to go to school, go to go to work. These are all quality of life issues uh, for my, mitochondrial disease patients. There are also real social, emotional, and economic consequences. Again, Dylan provided some background information. Our patient community is no different from any of the other rare disease communities in that it generates a significant amount of frustration and feelings of social isolation. These are important perspectives to capture and consider as we're advancing therapeutics are we addressing the most important concerns? So one of the first thing to do is to acknowledge the current state of affairs is not good enough. Only 23% of participants through the use of vitamins and supplements as standard of care feel that these, this type of lifestyle really uh, affords them a, a, a good quality of life. So again, a real need for improved therapeutics to um, improve the lives of these patients. So what should these uh, patients, uh, excuse me, these therapeutics look like? Well, the most important symptoms to the patients we capture here, and in this case, they do want to reduce fatigue and muscle weakness. They want to gain function, prolonging life, obviously in a pediatric population, really uh, important. But when we get to the, you know, what is it that would make a patient feel really excited about the developments taking place? Um, side effects are always, a current, of course, a concern. They want to know how long they'll be on the treatment. But that very last bullet point, I think, is an important one that was we teased out through this uh, patient-focused drug development meeting. These patients are willing to accept a certain amount of risk for a specified benefit. And that to me is a clear message to the FDA that we need increased flexibility within the regulatory flame, uh, framework. It's not to say that anything unsafe uh, should be prescribed to, to, to the patients approved and able to be prescribed, but these patients are willing to accept risk in order to get a benefit that aligns with their most uh, uh, highest prioritized symptoms. So let me just wrap up my, my comments here uh, uh, quickly. Uh, you know, of course, there's a large unmet medical need with no approved therapies. The diagnostic journey, similar to what Dylan said, is uh, it can be multi-year long, complex. They're seeing a lot of doctors. They're, they're experiencing a lot of symptoms. But I think 
Importantly, I, I hope my comments have reinforced for you the importance of getting the patient's perspective inside of therapeutic development. And there are many ways to do it. The patient-focused drug development meeting and the patient voice of patient report is only one example. Uh, we also run patient-populated registries, which allow us to collect data and, 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 and build this perspective right from the patient perspective. Uh, there's also patient-led research. We're part of consortia where the patients try to identify what's the most important, what are the biggest gaps that will address our largest concerns. And this has to be done in close collaboration with the scientific community, but it just creates a different dynamic in terms of what direction we're going to go based on what the patients have identified as top priorities. I cannot emphasize enough that in general across rare disease, we will not achieve success in developing therapeutics without increased regulatory flexibility. I know this is very important to the Every Life Foundation, certainly important to the United Mitochondrial Disease Foundation. Um, we strongly encourage our, our friends at the FDA to, to use accelerated approvals and, and bring these drugs to market and understand that patients are willing to uh, uh, accept a certain amount of risk uh, for uh, the potential of a benefit in improving their lives. And then lastly, I just want to mention that for, I think, many of the scientists in this room, uh, nothing replaces the opportunity to go to a scientific conference and have patients, families uh, there with you, co-attending. UMDF has done this for almost 25 years, and I've put uh, a link to our, our, our conference, which has a very robust scientific program, but also a patient track. And we always look for opportunities to intermingle all those stakeholders. And consistently, we always hear from the scientific community, I left with a much better understanding of the patient perspective. And I think that's our goal in, in all of this uh, work. So again, thank you and look forward to your questions. Thank you, Philip. All righty. So um, thank you to our three speakers. And now we'll move on to questions from the committee and from the um, uh, audience online. A reminder that you can put your questions in, the, in a link that you can find in the chat. Um, so I'd like to start with the very first question for all three of you, and anyone can, can take it, is that um, all of you have advocated for increased research on rare diseases, some of which can be attributed to problems in RNA modification. Who do you, and as someone who does work on rare diseases, I know that my research doesn't go forward without funding. So who do you think should be funding research on rare diseases and how do you advocate that they should be doing this? So I don't know who would like to take the first question. Philip, I can see Philip on the screen, so I'm gonna call him. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm happy to, to share a couple of thoughts on that. So, you know, UMDF is a, you know, sort of a soup to nuts uh, patient advocacy group, right? Where we, we do span from research to education, to support, to awareness. And so patient advocacy groups can play a really important role in seeding the research necessary to develop these therapeutics and achieve our overall mission goals. And so, you know, UMDF uh, has made over $15 million worth of, of research grants available uh, you know, to, to the community. But those are always meant to be seed grants, generate sufficient preliminary data that hopefully allows the researchers, the investigators to go and, and leverage that into a much larger R01 from someone like the NIH or the Department of Defense, NSF. There are you know, a variety of, uh, of larger pools of funds. So, you know. I think it starts with patient advocacy and that you, they can seed the market, but it re you really depend on the large funding agencies to drive it. Uh, and Dylan, do you have some thoughts on that? Yeah, uh, I can hop in. Um, so the main place is going to be at the NIH, uh, which I don't think is surprising to really anybody. Um, NCATS I, is a, really the home of rare disease research uh, at the NIH. Um, all institutes conduct their own, uh, but you might get more disease specific uh, once you get into individual institutes, whereas NCATS has their own division, uh, they actually essentially gave it a promotion uh, this, a couple about a year and a half ago from an office to a division of rare diseases research innovation. Um, they keep changing the name, so I'll make sure I get that one right. Um, and the reason I want to highlight that is because 
that's the NCATS is where you're seeing cross-platform research. And so one, one example is what I call what is they call PAVE GT, which is platform vector gene therapy. Uh, and so it's looking at how can that technology be utilized to treat multiple rare diseases uh, instead of looking at individuals. And so I would say NCATS um, is the best place to advocate for. I would also like to note uh, we're in budget season. So I have to say this as a policy person, uh, NIH uh, received about a 1.5% bump uh, from the president's budget, which is typically lower than what we see, but also the president's budget tends to be lower than what Congress eventually um, does do an increase for NIH. But the reason I want to flag it is because NCATS received flat funding. So all the full NIH got 1.5%, NCATS got flat funding. Uh, and so if you are advocates uh, and do speak to your senators or congressmen, please let them know to support NCATS research. Um, outside of that, I did want to flag that FDA also does some research here. This is more on uh, a little more on the clinical trial side, but I think it's important to note uh, they have what's known as the Orphan Products Grants Program, uh, and they have two uh, funding streams within that. Uh, one would be uh, natural history studies, uh, which I talked a little bit about, as well as uh, clinical trials. Uh, and they also have a new uh, grant program out that kind of runs tangentially to that, which will look at specifically neurodegenerative disorders. And I, I, Kathy, oh, sorry, go ahead. Kathy, any thoughts? Mm. Kathy, okay. Uh, so I probably can speak from a researcher's perspective. I think the bigger contribution part could come from NIH because it's more longer sustainable funding resource for a researcher. But we do really appreciate the money that coming from foundation because we know it's actually donated by patients, at least for myself. Whenever I spend in the foundation dollars, I feel I'm responsible for a cure. Yeah, no, I think I think that's really important for those of us, for those of us who do that, that that, that perspective of a researcher is very important. So just to follow up on that, now that we have a kind of your ideas on who should be funding it, how do you how do you advocate for something that's rare? So how do you make that argument? You guys must be up up against this all the time. Help us. I can start again, uh, if you like. Uh, you know, so uh, uh, yes, this is always a, a, a challenge. Um, you know, again, I spoke to the fact that I, the, you know, for for many, this word mitochondria is still you know very strange to them. Not so much in the scientific community, and there have been tremendous advances, right, in understanding mitochondrial biology to the point now where we know these rare inherited disorders are a perfect starting point for how do we improve mitochondrial function? It helps these rare patients, but because mitochondrial health is central to the human health condition, it really has the chance to impact literally every person on the face of the earth, right, with healthy aging. Take care of your mitochondria, eat well, exercise, you know, no big surprises, <laughs> but uh, it really makes a huge difference, and it's been demonstrated to be an important part of it. So I think we're fortunate in that we do have a connection that, that extends out, but for many rare diseases, it doesn't, right? It's just around the, that very small patient community. It doesn't make it any less important. It's just a different uh, situation. Dylan, anything to add? So coming from the broad rare disease community, um, we always say rare is not that rare um, because you have uh, one in 10 uh, are impacted by a rare disease. Um, do Speaking with a collective voice, uh, telling your story is always a key part for us. Mm -hmm. um, we actually just had our fly-in week uh, two weeks ago at this point, uh, in which advocates are meeting with the representatives to tell their story. Uh, and as somebody who's in on those meetings, that can be so impactful. So having the numbers is always great. There's a reason that we did that economic rare, uh, rare disease economic burden of rare disease study, uh, having that number is really helpful. Uh, we're also looking at the cost of the diagnostic odyssey. Um, and so having those numbers, I, I don't want to belittle that. Having those is can be extremely important. Uh, but pairing that with a story uh, is, is what is needed because numbers will get forgotten, but a story will not. Um, and so it's, it's personalizing the story a little bit uh, can, can be so important, specifically within rare diseases, because it is thought to be so uncommon, even though it is not. Anything to add, Kathy, or, or should we move on? We can move on. Okay. <laughs> so, um, 
Any any questions from the audience? We have one question in the room, and I think we need to move on because uh, we're a little behind schedule. But uh, Juan, go ahead. Yeah. So my question is for Philip, and um, clearly part of this enterprise of sequencing and mapping, mapping modifications, it is the reality that we need to talk about scale, and scale means different tissues, different organisms, yes. different RNAs. So from the point of view, RNA types, in particular in mitochondrial diseases, in your view, would you comment on which are the ones that are most affected by modifications yeah. as it relates to disease? Well, yeah, uh, you know, hard to give a, a short answer uh, you know, to, to a question like that. Um, you know, I, I focused on the neurological symptoms and, you know, and brain tissue, but it also presents the, the largest challenge, right, in being able to cross the blood-brain barrier and affect change inside the neuronal tissue. Um, you know, the, the, the greatest amount of clinical activity in the space is in the muscular system. Um, you know, it's so, you know, it, you, if you look at the symptoms that patients report, many of them are associated with muscle fatigue and weakness, and this impacts their quality of life in a myriad of ways. So I think the ability to um, you know, make modifications that are meaningful inside uh, muscle tissue may be the entry point right, for coming into the mitochondrial disease space. And hopefully then you know, heart tissue and brain tissue uh, will also be a part of uh, future developments. Great. Thank so Stephen, you're taking, it's, it's all, it's to you now. Great. Thank you so much, Susan. And thanks to all our panelists. Right, um, we're going to move forward now because uh, we have, uh, we're a little behind schedule, but we want to keep moving and we have a little bit of time at the end to play with. So uh, Kate, I'm going to bring up, sorry, I am going to bring up one of our committee members, Kate Meyer, who's going to walk us through what to do for breakout groups. Great, thanks. Um, so, right, uh, next we're gonna um, uh, branch out into some breakout groups and discuss some important questions. Um, for those of you who are online, you should be put into a breakout room, room automatically. And for those of you who are here in person, if you didn't grab one of these sheets at the table out there, please do so after um, I'm done talking here in a few minutes because it has everyone's breakout group assignments. Um, so I'm not going to talk very long. I'll just state the six main questions that we're going to tackle as a group. So the first is establishing the near and long-term goals for mapping and sequencing RNA modifications. The second is understanding educational and workforce needs. The third is understanding the impact of epitranscriptomics on health and medicine. Uh, the fourth big question is establishing ideas, metrics, and standards for database and infrastructure needs. Um, the fifth topic will be establishing metrics of success in the field of mapping and sequencing RNA modifications. And then lastly, determining the importance of the field within the larger landscape of the life and medical sciences. So for those of you who are, gonna, who are in person, I'll just make a quick note that if you're in groups one, two, or three, you're going to be here in this room discussing. If you're in groups four or five, you'll be right next door in 118. And those of you in group six are going to be just across the hall in 114, and there will be someone outside to direct you. Um, so with that, I'll, I'll um, let everyone kind of go into their breakout groups. I will say, please designate one person who can be your representative, because we're going to reconvene at 1045. Um, and we'll have the representative from each group tell us about how they address the main questions under their under their primary topic. Sound good? With um, the, the in-person uh, breakout group uh, for the first topic of establishing the near and long-term goals for mapping and sequencing RNA chemical modifications. So maybe if the point person can just come up to the mic and, you know, I would say just two minutes or less, just summarize what you guys talked about. If you wanna address each of the specific questions, that's great. If you wanna just more generally describe what you guys discussed, that works too. Thanks, Kate. So the first group, we had a lot of great discussion. I think from the short-term perspective, one of the key outcomes, if we're going to be able to do mapping and sequencing is the technology needs to be improved. There's no doubt the technology is not there to do this at the scale that folks want to do it with the accuracy and with the end goal of having useful some other ideas that were brought up in terms of short-term focus is 
how to bring new users into this area. What can we do to incentivize additional research and researchers who are interested in this? Some of the ideas that were brought up by the group are, do you think about starting to do crowdsourcing? Do you do a little game theory? So you make it more competition-based, different ways a user curated or a user involved database to do this. Um, I think the long-term goal is how do you have a source of truth that is out there that everybody can go to look at and say, regardless of whatever transcript I'm looking at, here's where the modifications are for this particular system, whether it's this cell under these environmental conditions, what it might be, that would be obviously the Holy Grail or the unicorn, maybe as we think about it. Um, let's see, what else? Let me check my notes. Um, I think some of the barriers that we identified it, are access to standards. So what are those standards? Barriers also involve, you know, what are all the right approaches, including the reagents, antibodies, the purification, um, the samples that everyone would have. Also barriers on the um, data side. So how do we access all this data? Who stores it? Who's gonna be responsible for it? Um, quality control came up more than once in the conversation to understand how this is and the need for some SOPs so that everybody is understanding how things are being done. Some of the, the thoughts that were shared is, um, you know, one of the ideas and how do you start organizing to move towards these goals and get this is, do you think of consortia that are based on, that are charged with specific modifications and specific types of RNA? and they sort of help define and set what their goal should be within those groups? Or do you do it a little bit broader and you let the whole community be involved? I know my group's all over. Is there anything else we miss? I miss? I that's great, that's thank you. I think uh, in the interest of, of time, I won't add further comment, but I think that's fantastic. Touched on a lot of things we heard about yesterday, but also um, some new ideas for how to address some of these um, uh, hurdles. So let's go now to um, online uh, group one addressing this question. Do we have a rep representative from the breakout group one online? So we don't know what numbers we are. So you should. Uh, uh, Josh Burdick is. Oh, is yes. Hi. Our group. Josh, why don't you just give it a go? Sorry, I lost track of the number there. Oh, um, okay. Yeah, we heard from people who worked in mitochondrial, someone working in mitochondrial uh, disease. And in that case, it seemed that uh, mass spec was the most useful way to find modifications in tRNA. And uh, also heard someone working in ribosomal um, RNA. <clears throat> finding that nanopore and other mass spec was not as useful. Um, so it seems like there's complementary structures, uh, strengths for different uh, technologies. And also mentioned was that in embryogenesis and many other things, there's cell type specific things, which uh, so addressing that would be important. Um, and also the need for standards. Uh, is is clearly there um and i think that's uh the the biggest things that i heard fantastic but... yeah thank you very much i think this is great okay um now we can move on to to group two uh in person group two understanding educational and workforce needs hi uh, can everyone hear me? Yeah. So uh, I was in group two um, and we talked primarily, my name is David, <laughs> and we uh, talked primarily about uh, putting an emphasis on undergraduate training um, to meet this critical need to um, increase the number of researchers sort of working in this field. And we talked about um, sort of um, jumping off of Wendy Gilbert's point from yesterday about the need for more computational training for 
students more focused in the biological sciences at the undergraduate level. We um, sort of riffed on that for a little bit and um, uh, sort of came to one possible proposal, which is for if there was some pot of money to um, devoted to this, this need, we could uh, sort of uh, have institutions apply to get funding to um, host, um, you know, sort of one or two week workshops to sort of uh, get students sort of off, you know, off to some sort of start to learn how to do uh, computational biology in the context of maybe analysis of, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, results involving studies of RNA modifications. And um, this could be built, each institution doesn't have to sort of build this workshop from scratch. They could use um, existing workshops like at Cold Spring Harbor laboratories and, and other places sort of as templates to, to, to design their own. Um, and so that was one idea and, and, and that we, this would be executed in a way that would be mindful um, and sort of inclusive of um, sort of uh, many sorts of students, including those that historically have not been um, in this field or, you know, in the biological or computational sciences. And so, you know, for example, um, if a student had to sort of uh, leave their, uh, you know, summer internship for a couple of weeks um, or couldn't work for a couple of weeks, that they would actually be paid um, to, 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 this, to, um, to do one of these workshops. And this would be sort of an investment in the future of the field to having more uh, diverse groups. The other thing we talked about was, uh, you know, to understand a lot of these talks that we've heard, you have to have some understanding of chemistry. It's RNA chemical modification. So the need to um, promote this research in sort of undergraduate curricula was uh, discussed as well. And so to how do we sort of get um, chemists um, excited about, even those that are not in our field, excited about teaching their students sort of at the undergraduate level about the sort of questions that, you know, you can, that we're excited about, but they have no idea about and may never know until it's too late. So um, we didn't uh, come to any specific recommendations, I think, for that. And we discussed the challenges of um, changing curricula, for example, you know, adding biology, you know, telling biology curriculum committees to replace a year of something else with a year of computational training. Um, but for chemistry, I think even just sort of introducing the idea of RNA chemical modifications in coursework would even be pretty helpful. And I think that was most of what we talked about. That's great. Thank you. Yeah, I love the idea of having workshops and thinking about how we can introduce this topic as early as possible to our future workforce. I think that's really great. Okay, um, so we'll move on to topic three, um, understanding the impact of epitranscriptomics on health and disease. So let's have our in-person group three go first, and then we'll do our online group three. Oh, I thought there was no online group two. Okay, well, okay. All right, well, great idea. We'll do that. We'll do all the in-person, then all the online. Uh, okay, um, I, I'm Tao Pian. Uh, so our group three is in charge for understanding the impact of transcriptomes and health and, and medicine. Uh, there were uh, sorry, three questions. Um, Post here. The first one is what is already known about how the epitranscriptome impacts different health conditions. So, so the, I think we discussed, uh, for instance, some modification enzymes. They are overexpressed in cancers, and they they basically these cells become addicted to them. Why? Because these enzymes then modify, for instance, certain tRNAs, and these tRNAs are needed to do translation regulation of certain oncogenes such as a MEK and so on. And um, we also uh, okay. So then. The uh, then the question actually comes about is how do how about the actual RNA modifications? How would these directly impact health and disease? And so so those are of course the best known for something like mitochondrial tRNA disease, for instance, where you have mutations in mitochondrial tRNA is actually leading to a missing modifications that actually real cause of dysfunction in mitochondrial translation. Um, and then uh, the second is how has knowledge of the EP transcriptome been utilized for treatment and diagnosis? So the treatment is, 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 again, I think the known drugs, as far as I know, that they target uh, writer proteins for, for instance, made us for the MCXA or writer proteins for the dimethyl-G modifications, but only targeting a sp very specific cancer type. So that because these cancer types are specifically overexpressed them or doing something differently about, about them, again, leading to the misregulation of, say, uh, oncogenic proteins and so on. 
Um, the one thing uh, uh, we, we discussed is that actually there is a the billion dollar industry out there of small RNA, small molecule drugs targeting the RNA structure, based on the RNA stability, based on the RNA localization. And for that, uh, at least for, in a conference I went to last October, people talk about all these great things and yet there was no really consideration, at least no data on what happened when the, any of these RNAs are actually modified in, in vivo in cells. And then, so that is the consideration that perhaps mapping of the EP transcriptome, at least in the mesonary RNAs, was going to help out a great deal. And another thing is known uh, for the uh, actual modifications. This are uh, some classic examples will be snow RNA that actually impacting ribosome RNA modifications that also turn out to matter a lot in, in, a, in cancer space. Um, then uh, uh, finally, uh, the other question, what the information is missing being able to fully understand how the EP transcript impacts health and, and medicine. So the first thing we, we talked about are the coordination of the three family of RNAs. There's a ribosome RNA, tRNA, and mesonary RNA modifications. And, and, and clearly, all three of them play a role in really uh, making the proteins that are going to matter for health and disease. So, so, the, the, so yeah, so I think that's kind of a card. That kind of information is currently... Uh, I mean, we know some specific cases, but this at omic level is definitely not there yet, and 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 it would be nice to, to to know these things. Fantastic, yeah, and I think you're touching on some really important points that haven't been talked about um, extensively yet in the meeting, including you know small molecule targeting of RNAs and the impact of modifications and even things like you know targeted pseudourelation and and other things that can potentially be important therapeutically. Great, All right. Julius? Great. Uh, Julius Lux, we were group four on establishing standards and in infrastructure. So I've got four takeaway points. One is the universal need for standards. I think we all recognize that both in terms of biological standards and the data standards. Um, the second one is the need to consider the entire pipeline when thinking about these and establishing them from the synthetic oligos that we've talked about a lot at the meeting, but also to the experimental protocols and a lot uh, more discussions needed on data storage, dissemination, and even visualization. Um, the third major point is the variety of challenges um, that this particular project um, will bring to light, things about data uh, format, um, data storage, and I think uh, very importantly, com community buy-in and compliance with whatever's developed. Um, there's a lot of really interesting differences between DNA sequences and the RNA modifications that we want to map and sequence, both in terms of the complexity of data uh, in the RNA realm, the accuracy of some of the techniques that are being uh, developed to deliver us this data. And those things are driving a value in actually storing and, and learning how to deal with the raw data so that if algorithms improve, we can go back and still utilize this resource. There's also a really, um, fascinating conceptual challenge with, with the dynamic nature of these RNA modifications that really affects how much data is collected and stored. It affects the metadata we need to have to describe this. It affects the visualization of this data and, and the entire infrastructure for all of that. The fourth point is who is in charge of establishing all of this? So we've got and this is just a bunch of questions. Um, so for development, you know, we heard from NIST, maybe they would play a role. There's also many roles for the community, both in terms of researchers uh, and industry. They're, you know, who's in charge of setting these standards? Maybe NIST does some, maybe IUPAC even sets some, for example, to determine letter, single letters for all of these uh, bases. Um, who's in charge of maintaining this infrastructure? NCBI came up as a, a possibility. And who's in charge of policies to enforce this? Is this an NIH thing with new data um, policies that just came online? Is this a journals thing? For example, nucleic acids research demanding deposition of the data. So I'll leave it at that. Fantastic. Yeah, these are all really important questions and um, I think really good to be thinking about them. Thanks. Okay, um, we'll do in-person group five next. Group five, yeah. Establishing metrics of success in the field of mapping and sequencing modifications. Okay, so uh, we're group five and we had two questions. 
um, on establishing the metrics of success in the field of mapping and sequencing of RNA chemical modifications. The first question was, um, what are some of the advancement met metrics for um, quantifying the progress in epitranscriptomics? And so we had six uh, kind of bullet points. The first one had kind of two layers to it. Uh, the first layer is a standard workflow for sample prep processing for RNA modification assay that is adopted by an industry partner. We think that's really important to have something that's not just used in a lab, but something that is actually, you know, a true sign of adoption is, uh, or, or, you know, a true metric is advancement to the point where there is an industrial, you know, one or two, preferably two. And, and actually that's the second layer of that is to have competition within that. Um, so for example, by, by sulfide workflow for RNA-seq or the Oxford platform for RNA-seq libraries, that, that's a sign where things are now adoptable and usable by others. The second is a low-cost te technology for sequencing and mapping a particular modification routinely with established accuracy and bias. So it's important that the accuracy and bias are fully established. The third is a good metric of success for uh, um, Oh, oh, sorry, a good metric for success for one modification should be the drive for adoption for another modification. So um, I think, you know, uh, I guess uh, we kind of can repeat the same metrics for other modifications. So it's kind of a, until we get through all of them. <laughs> um, uh, and then the elevation of status of a particular modification um, to a clinically relevant marker. So if, the, if there's a particular either sequence that hosts a particular modification uh, that is cl clinically relevant. I think that's a very strong uh, metric of success um, for that. Um, demonstration of a framework for integrating technologies for combinatorial modification detection. So this is more of a question of how do we integrate knowledge about, let's say we, we have assays for different modifications. How do we um, integrate those into a unified um, annotation? Um, and then finally, um, either the organic or top-down development of a framework for sharing data and ensuring reproducibility across users. And then the second question was, how often should we be measuring success and who's responsible for measuring success? And for that, we had, um, uh, we, we thought that a center type um, in age grant had the right mechanisms for, for that. Um, for example, an external review board and annual reviews by program managers, by you know internal reviews by uh, by the participants in the in the consortium, um, and uh, in terms of the actual data and you know measuring the success in terms of the the way the data is handled and managed, uh, we brought up maybe maybe NIST for <laughs> for managing some of the data um, and and kind of curation of the standard data and you know maybe standard samples too. Um, and that's about all we have. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you. Okay. Um, let's move along to the final in-person group. Hi, Stacey Horner. So, oh, sorry, I can't read this. Um, so our group was tasked with determining the importance of the field within the larger landscape in life and medical sciences. I thought many of these ideas were already covered by group three. Um, so Tal gave a great example of RNA modifications being important for disease, but so I'm just going to summarize kind of our overall discussion which is we don't know what we don't know. And so sequencing everything, while we don't know what's gonna be important, it's really hard to know if you don't know what's there. And so we think there's a clear need for that um, related to other groups. We think there need to be clear standards and metrics and education so that everybody's doing the same thing. When you have that map, then you can go further. So things that we know that RNA modifications are important for are regulating gene expression, you know, that, and that includes translation. But the one good thing that our group also mentioned was that it could be important for drug design. If you think about what Moderna is doing, some of the modifications, we may not know how they're gonna impact disease, but they could impact function in a drug design. And so for that reason, they would be important to consider thinking about. Um, and then the other case um, that we talked about is, you know, which RNA do you sequence? And it's the same thing, we don't know what we don't know. And so sequencing every RNA at some level is probably worthwhile, including RNAs from uh, viruses, bacteria. And if you think about um, you know, RNA modifications have clear roles in regulating different aspects of viral infection. Antibiotics or novel antibiotics that could treat RNA modifications, bacteria could also be really important to consider. So we kind of think thinking across a broader tree of life would be important. 
Great. Thanks. All fantastic points. Okay. Let's move on to our final two online groups. And maybe in the interest of time, um, if you can um, let us know any of the new things that haven't been discussed already that you talked about. Um, so I, I guess we heard from breakout group two already. So maybe let's start with breakout group one. Uh, hi. Oh. Yeah, I think I got um, posthumously elected to do this. So uh, many of the things that we discussed on near-term and long-term goals have already been covered by other groups. So I'll try to make this short. We talked a lot about uh, in the near term, needing a lot of new tools. Uh, specifically, some examples were better uh, nucleases so that RNA could be segmented into smaller um, oligos for a mass spec analysis. And this would be nice to have a whole suite of these nuclease enzymes that would operate in very known uh, sequences or motifs. Um, secondly, uh, sort of plug and play ways to synthesize standards so that we could um, put any modification anywhere in a way that it can become a standard for, uh, for testing. For example, being able to develop methylation enzymes that could place methyl groups on either two prime hydroxyl of ribose or on any base where you desire would be fantastic. Um, or other, uh, other ways to incorporate modifications so that doesn't have to be 100% incorporation and in every 100% uh, replacement uh, as is done for vaccines. Uh, third thing we talked about was um, basically facilities. Um, could, uh, could there be a movement toward having core facilities that could do RNA mapping so that not every lab has to be an expert in the techniques? Um, we also talked about national facilities, but I think uh, local core facilities might make more sense. And then in terms of talking about um, uh, long-term goals, we uh, agreed with other speakers at the workshop that the long-term goals will emerge as we are able to study all the modifications and figure out what's really important. It's very hard to say that a priori, which modifications will be the most important because it could be an interaction or the confluence of two or more modifications that are actually uh, what's particularly disease relevant. So, um, so we weren't really able to define long-term goals yet. Sure. <laughs> That's great, That's thank you very much. Perfect. Um, okay, we'll, we'll hear from our last uh, online group. Hi, I'll, I'll report out for our group. Um, so I was in a group that had um, Todd, Ja, Shweta, and um, Leroy. So it was a really interesting group. We had a few chemists, a few biologists, and also an uh, SRO from uh, NIEHS. So it was a really interesting conversation that we had. One of the first major points that we sort of came across was that, um, you know, biologists and chemists need to to need to talk more um, and especially, you know, talking to our synthetic chemists about what our biology needs are. And that still seems to be, even though we talk about it a lot, still seems to be a disconnect. Um, and so that was one major point that we came across. And I'll mention, we kind of went off script a little bit and didn't talk about anything specifically um, related to what we were supposed to talk about, but a lot of good stuff came out. Um, another thing that came up was that um, we can't really understand the big picture if we're not thinking about multiple modifications that could be on any given RNA molecule, um, how these um, work combinatorially and crosstalk um, within the same molecule and then also with other molecules. Um, so that was an important thing that came up that I don't know if we necessarily heard, but Cynthia kind of mentioned this in her, her report out as well, kind of thinking about maybe be multiple modifications that could be, um, you know, at play in any given situation. Um, another thing is, of course, everyone talks about standards, but somebody brought up um, that maybe, you know, in, in her day-to-day -day work, 
as a biologist working um, with mass spec, maybe the standard doesn't necessarily need to be at its most perfect stage, like um, our NIST level standards. Maybe um, we can all work together to work with what we have um, and kind of go from there. And then our very final um, discussion was sort of around funding and how we actually make sure that we're funding multiple efforts and not just you know one big effort and then kind of realizing later on, well, wait, we missed an opportunity. So um, sort of talked about not specific ways, but that there's a need to get funding out quickly, prioritize quickly, and then kind of have regular check-ins with the community and be able to discuss challenges and pivot very quickly in a different direction without losing the interest of the broader community in funding um, entities and, and so on. Yep, those are all great points. Thanks very much. And I'm told that we did have one more online group as well. So now we'll hear from our last online group. Hello. Uh, so very quickly, um, our group, I'm Jessica Silva Fisher, and our group was tasked with talking about the standards and for and database. I think one of the overall themes that we were talking about was that it is really too early to understand the complexity of potentially what a database can be. And we really need a lot of more small projects to occur so we can identify the breadth of what we actually need. Um, but some of the thoughts that we did come across and discuss were potentially that Database definitely needs to be cross-referenced, integrated. Um, we're not only talking about, for instance, one field, right? We're talking about transcriptomics, we're talking about mass spectrometry, we're talking about potentially structure. So we need to make sure that the database actually incorporates all of this, right? So it definitely needs to be highly complex. We also talked about the accessibility. So we need to make sure that it is accessible to all different types of biologists, all different fields. Um, so not only those who know how to do genomics or transcriptomics, right, bioinformatics, but also those who are basic biologists, um, including those at stages of all levels, right? We're talking about the younger generation who are highly computational already, but you know, what about the other fields that may not be so computational? So just basically to make sure that everyone can access um, the database. Additionally, we also think we need to kind of step back. There are so many databases currently out there already that are extremely useful, right, in every single type of field. So how about just stopping and thinking about what we like from those databases and how we can incorporate what they are doing to utilize for a database and infrastructure that we have. Um, some of the other topics that we said were discussed there about storage issues, taking the raw data, how to compress it. Um, who's going to maintain it? That's going to be extremely important. It's going to be a lot of information from a lot of different areas. So who exactly is going to be maintaining this and making sure that it is highly organized? Um, another thing we talked about, um, which was very important, I think, was also about the mass spectrometry, right? This is its own important, really big field that's going to be in um, RNA modification. So not everyone can have a mass spectrometry in their lab, right? So one thing we need to think about, it's expensive, is how can we actually outsource them, maybe some type of incentives, right? Utilize the current really great structures, of the core facilities and things that are at all the different universities, right? And utilize those structures in order for us to get that type of information um, and see what they have. Um, when we did talk about the standards and metrics, you know, again, I we all probably agreed that is really too early to understand. This may be disease specific. It may be the question you're asking that, you know, um, you may need to look at your standards. Um, we are really early. So even simple things like antibodies are still being optimized of what we need to use with all the different pull down essays, right? Do we need to look at stoichiometry? Do we need to look at the different modifications? We don't even know what the percentages are of the modifications, you know, depending on the disease type, the state type, you know, even cell type. Um, and also, of course, you know, do one of these standards actually need to just be a biological outcome, right? If the modification is important and it's causing some type of function or, you know, some type of phenotype, you know, maybe that needs to be incorporated as well. And that is going to actually be dependent on the question that you're asking. Um, and lastly, I guess, like I said, the overall theme was that, you know, we are really early in understanding uh, you know, what these modifications are doing. And so, you know, we really think we would benefit from having some small science being done and, you know, learning from what, you know, these small groups are actually doing and um, learning from that to actually create this type of database infrastructure and standards as well. So great. Thanks very much. And um, thank you to all the breakout groups. These are some fantastic ideas and lots of important things to think about. Um, I'll turn it over to Stephen, who can tell us about our, our break. Great. So we are uh, quite behind. Um, so I'm going to allow for a five minute break. So, uh, but please try to be back here 1125 sharp. 
uh, so that we can make sure to get through all of the next session since there are a lot of folks who we still have to hear from. Uh, but thank you all. Sarath. Can Great. Uh, well, thanks, everybody. Uh, my name is Julie Sucks from Northwestern University, and I'm very excited to be moderating this last session of the public portion of our workshop. Uh, we're going to be talking about uh, emerging tools, technologies, methodologies, and information that are not currently applied to the process of mapping and sequencing the epi transcriptome, at least not at the scale that we have been talking about. But uh, there's a lot of potential opportunities to utilize these tools and ideas to, to advance the field. So we're going to be hearing about three types of, of tools and concepts. One is about the mechanisms of our readers and writers that we've heard a little bit about, um, try to figure out how they might play into mapping um, these modifications. We're then going to hear about artificial intelligence techniques for uh, sequence and, and RNA structure recognition and prediction. And then we're going to wrap up with uh, some updates on cryo-EM um, for structural determination uh, in this approach. So we've got three blocks of speakers. Each speaker is going to speak for 10 minutes. And at, once the speakers are done in that section, uh, we'll then open it up for questions as we've been doing. So um, I'll, I'll kick off the first little sub um, section on mechanisms of RNA readers and writers by introducing Danitsa Fujimori, who's a professor of cellular and molecular pharmacology and pharmaceutical chemistry at, uh, and associate director of the Quantitative Biosciences Institute at UCSF. Her lab combines organic chemistry and biochemical reconstitution to investigate enzymatic mechanisms and regulatory roles of post-translational and post-transcriptional modifications. Danitsa, take it away. Uh, thank you so much for the introduction. Can you hear me okay and see my slides? Uh, yeah, uh, yes. Great, thank you. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to present in this workshop. I enjoyed yesterday's sessions and uh, I've learned a lot and look forward to, to today's program, remainder of the today's program as well. So what I'd like to tell you about is uh, our applications of mechanism-based strategies as well as structural methods to map RNA modifications. And at the center of this will be two enzymes that modify the uh, bacterial ribosome. Um, as many of you are, are aware, bacterial ribosome is uh, one of the major antibiotic targets targeted by 40% of clinically used antibiotics. And functionally relevant sites for antibiotic bindings are those that are functionally relevant to the function of the ribosome as well in peptide bond formation. So majority of antibiotics that target ribosome bind in peptidyl transferase center region of the ribosome and the adjacent nascent peptide exit tunnel. Uh, pathogens have evolved a number of mechanisms to inactivate um, antibiotics by modifying their binding site within the ribosome. Among these, methylation predominates as a small modification that is sufficiently large to occlude antibiotic binding site without disrupting the function of the ribosome. Over the years, uh, many uh, methylating enzymes have been um, identified that uh, decorate ribosomes through modifications in the peptidyl transferase center and the nascent peptide tunnel, as well as a, at the interface of the subunits. The enzyme that our lab has been investigating is uh, sorry, chlorophenicol fluorophenicol resistance enzyme, or CFR, which confers resistance to um, eight classes of antibiotics, including uh, these five that are used clinically or in veterinary medicine. CFR, as we abbreviate it, modifies a conserved nucleotide, the A2503 in 23S ribosomal RNA, uh, to introduce a, a methylation to C8 methyl group of adenosine. Interestingly, this nucleotide is pre-methylated by a housekeeping enzyme called RLMN, which introduces this conserved uh, C2, uh, sorry, pointer, that introduces a conserved C2 uh, modification that is not associated with the resistance. Once hypermethylated, this resulting ribosome is resistant to, to antibiotics. CFR and RLMN are mechanistically related, and uh, our lab and others has investigated um, uh, mechanisms by which uh, methylation by these enzymes occurs. 
What is unique to this class of the enzyme is formation of a covalent intermediate in between the enzyme and RNA substrate. So I'll just walk you quickly through the catalytic cycle. In a resting state, there are two conserved cysteines, of which one gets pre-methylated and then activated by uh, 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 in a radical stem fashion to form this reactive thiomethylene intermediate. Addition of the thiomethylene forms the covalent intermediate in between the enzyme and the substrate, which is then resolved through the activity of the second conserved system. What our lab uh, has demonstrated is that if we mutagenize the second resolved cysteine into an alanine, we can stabilize this intermediate as shown here uh, in, uh, on a gel. We can uh, um, enrich for it. Uh, we can isolate it by using a appropriate affinity tag on the enzyme and then characterize the nature of the, of the bond in between um, enzyme and the substrate, which we've used for mechanistic studies. But we have also expanded this to identification of substrates and sites of methylation by this class of enzymes. So briefly, the approach relies on incorporation of the alanine mutant, alanine uh, mutant that cannot um, affect the uh, release of the methylated uh, RNA product, on a flag tagged enzyme in the background of, of uh, E. coli lacking the enzyme. We use that flag tag then to enrich the RNA substrate, proteinase K to digest the enzyme, leaving a small polypeptide scar, and then we obtain the uh, enriched uh, um, RNA uh, uh, substrates, which are sequenced and identified through, through next generation sequencing. We've had tested um, several reverse transcriptases, and for the purposes of, of this workshop, I think it's uh, uh, important to, to highlight the need for uh, um, uh, reverse transcriptases with varying abilities to either cause stops or uh, incorporate mismatches. We have used TIGERT as a reverse transcriptase that reliably incorporates mismatches at the site of the polypeptide scar as a way to identify, to validate the substrates, but also identify sub, uh, sites of modification with nucleotide precision. So using this strategy, we've been able to validate all of the non-substrates of E. coli R element. It's a rather promiscuous methylating enzyme. In addition to 23S ribosomal RNA, it modifies several of the tRNAs. And what we see is that these um, uh, tRNA substrates are largely enriched. And in the cases when they are not enriched, such as the, this glutamine UUG, we were able to detect the substrate through mismatch incorporation. So another uh, valuable use of, of, of mismatch incorporation in validation of, of RNA substrates. And with this, I'd like to switch gear and tell you about structural methods that we've applied for identification of, of modifications. In, um, in the past uh, uh, decade or more, uh, CryoEM has uh, uh, really revolutionized the field of uh, structural biology, including that of the ribosome. And um, in uh, 2020, we've been able to obtain the CryoEM structure of the E. coli ribosome at a resolution of uh, uh, 2.15 angstroms. Now, uh, resolution of the structure is better in the uh, uh, core part of the ribosome, in the peptidyl transferase center, and the resolution there reaches uh, sub-2 angstroms, which allowed us to map modification. So the way this looks in practice is uh, highlighted here. We've been able to use cryoEM density maps to uh, model RNA modifications, such as this methylation of U, C2 methylation of A2503, uh, methylation on the ribose uh, 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 of, of another nucleotide, and also to determine uh, reliably positions of waters and metal ions based on their density and uh, coordination spheres. Um, uh, in the process of, the, of, of this work, Iris Young, a uh, talented computational scientist in the Fraser lab, has developed a tool that I think community will find quite useful uh, that we call QPTXM, or Quantifying Post-Transcriptional Modifications Tool. What this tool does is interrogates uh, uh, regions of the uh, cryo-EM map for automated detection of RNA modification. And what goes as an input into the tool is geometry of the, uh, of the modification. So is it at the appropriate angle based on the known hybridization of the atoms to which it is attached? Uh, distance. So uh, what is the distance of, of new density relative to the nearest uh, heteroatom and, and does it decay 
uh, as one goes away from the density. And of course, the quality of the density, which restricts this tool to well-resolved regions of the map. Iris has developed a, a, a good plugin for interactive viewing of, of modifications that the tool calls for us, which is really, really critical given, like in many other methods, high false positive rate. Despite the high false positive rate, rate what we find the tool very useful for is calling uh, uh, modifications in an automated way that we can then manually inspect that the sites uh, predicted to be modifications to truly assess if, if modifications are there. And using that, we've been able to, to uh, convincingly uh, annotate some of the modifications that are in, la in, in, in uh, abundant stoichiometries in well-resolved regions of the map. So in uh, just the last, last minute, um, um, I'd like to highlight also our work on um, obtaining structure of uh, hypermethylated ribosome, where the key problem was that the CFR is isolated from Staph aureus, it's the enzyme that we and others do biochemistry with, has really poor, relatively poor ability to methylate um, ribosome within E. coli. To overcome that very type stoichiometric methylation, we carried out directed evolution under antibiotic selection to improve methylation of the ribosome. And using that, we were able to uh, obtain nearly stoichiometrically methylated ribosome. And they're unambiguously based on the cryo-EM uh, uh, maps, uh, identify position of the newly introduced metal group. To our knowledge, this gave us a first view um, uh, of how antibiotic binding pocket is occluded to eight distinct, chemically distinct classes of antibiotic stress single methylation. And uh, uh, that knowledge now allows us to um, identify regions of antibiotics that sterically cl clash with CFR modified ribosome, which um, is uh, valuable to design of next generation antibiotics that are overcoming uh, resistance. And with that, I'd like to, to thank my lab and especially Vanya Stojkovic, Caitlin Tsai, and Kevin McCasker, who have uh, uh, contributed to uh, data that I've shown to you, our collaborators in structural biology and directed evolution, and all of you for your attention. So I look forward to the discussion after the next talk. Thank you, Danitza. So I'm going to introduce our next speaker, um, Fanurios Tamamis, who is an associate professor of chemical engineering at Texas A&M. His research focuses on the computational study of interactions between proteins and modified RNAs and DNAs. Hello. Uh, first, I would like to thank, uh, thank you for inviting me here and for the chance to present my work and to hear the interesting findings that you have, uh, we have all shared here. So allow me to start with a brief introduction. So you, we all understand that chemical modifications to RNAs are important in biological and disease-related mechanisms, and they are critical for health. There are several studies mapping the location and abundance of a handful of RNA modifications. So particularly RNA protein complexes are central to processes in the cell, and they have been studied experimentally and computationally, and RNA modifications which are dynamic and reversible can modulate such interactions and mediate the rapid responses to environmental changes. It is uh, thus important to understand the dynamic interplay between RNA modifications, writing, reading, and erasing. So here I'm providing some of the challenges in understanding the impact of RNA modifications, most of which we have uh, discussed about in this meeting. And uh, uh, I am focusing on the fact that it's important to integrate experimental and computational approaches uh, together to help in understanding protein interactions with RNA modifications. So what is the problem we have looked at? Um, my lab computational in collaboration with uh, Lydia Contreras experimental lab. Given a protein, what is the spectrum of RNA modifications that can be recognized and how they can, how are they recognized? For example, here you can see the target protein with this E. coli PNPase protein. Here you see uh, an RNA nucleoside. And the question we ask is, given that we're looking at this position, what are the different RNA modifications that can be present there and interact favorably with this protein target? So the solution we came up with is, this com is a computational protocol characterizing modified RNAs with proteins that operates in two stages. In stage one, we have a fast and efficient screening 
of RNA modifications binding to the protein in stage two. We have an in-detail in examination of selected modifications that come from this screening uh, and uh, using uh, more accurate simulations and phenology calculations. The inputs we're giving is the structure of the protein RNA complex, the position or positions to modify the library of RNA modifications to examine and the topology and parameter of RNA modifications. And the output is identifying high affinity RNA modifications and in, in, in the end modeling the complex structure and also being able to derive by physical insights. Allow me to show some, some details about some stages of this tool that was uh, published. So, so here you see um, the protein and the RNA strand. And in the first step, I've told you that we, we had a, a high, high throughput-like screening tool, which in, which in which we truncate the protein, and we're looking at the small portion of the protein that contains the RNA binding site. We're doing simulations in implicit solvents to save time. We are performing short simulations, and we have also modifications arranged in clades. For example, you see the clade of guanine here, and you see that you know the way the the, the tool or, uh, operates is that if this if this is for example favorable, then we proceed to investigate this. If this ends up not being favorable, then in then the the next modification would not have been explored. Now, in the particular problem we we initially aimed at to solve with Lydia. We looked at PNPAs, this is an RNA strand, and we looked at which modifications can be present at positions four and eight. For example, we would, would modify four and eight simultaneously. And uh, this is based on the fact that these are key positions interacting with the particular protein and also based on the biophysical mechanism associated with this protein here. So allow me to go on just briefly to the results. So we have uh, we had the protocol screening out uh, um, a big amount of uh, RNA modifications. We, then we had selected modifications that we we studied using detailed simulations, uh, explicit solvent uh, MD simulations, and then phenology calculations. And here you see computational results plotted against experimental results. We have a I would say a, a quite good correlation between computations and experiments. And we predicted adoxon G to be a good binder, but also uh, computational results, the results uh, delineated additional RNA modifications that are, are binding to E. coli, for example, PNPAs. And of course, you can also see that we were able to identify which, which were less favorable. So after solving this problem, the next problem we aim to solve with Lydia was the inverse problem, which is given an RNA with an RNA modification, can we design, which we call it, can we do computational evolution of the protein so that we can have a protein binding with higher affinity and or specificity to that modification? So <clears throat> this is technically the inverse problem. And uh, we, we aimed at solving this problem because PNA, uh, PNPAs plays an important role in supporting cellular tolerance to oxidative stress. And however, I want you to understand that there are key challenges when you're trying to solve such a problem. Of course, you need to, for example, understand that if we are aiming to solve such a problem, there are so many residues in close proximity to the RNA strand, so we, might, we need to find the the most critical ones. So this comes, we need to select. And particular, a particular challenge to this system is that we are dealing with a homotrimeric protein and each mutated residue would interact with, would interact with different parts of the bound DNA. Another key aspect I want to highlight here is that we need atomistic detail to capture such effects when designing. So long story short, we, we follow the similar approach Again, we're pro providing a structure, fast screening, detail, uh, followed by, uh, by detailed simulations and finishing calculations, investigating now the most promising protein mutants binding to RNA modification. And the output is identifying high affinity protein mutants, modeling and providing biophysical insights. Um, and 
For example, in the end, we have proteins recognizing RNA modifications with improved affinity and or selectivity. So to, to do this study, first of all, we had to select which are the most critical positions that we would uh, computationally design and then experimentally test. So initially, we used biophysical approaches to select these positions, and we ended up selecting three positions. And then we used bioinformatics to, to technically to limit the number of modifications that are possible on the protein. And then we went back to biophysics to do screening and out of, of, of the possibilities that came up from, from bioinformatics, select the modifications and design the protein to bind um, uh, with high affinity to particular modifications. And in this case, the modification was a doxon G at uh, investigated at position eight and nine. So we, after sending the results to Lydia, we were very happy to see the experimental validation of the results. And we have seen that, so these are our design mutants uh, in comparison to the wild type. And we have seen that we have been able to computationally now design a protein with a slightly higher affinity and specificity, and specificity for ADOXOG with respect to the wild type. And here you also see our ability after we derive these user simulation snapshots to, to, do an, to, to perform an in-depth biophysical analysis and understand which interactions from the mutations we have introduced contribute most to an enhanced affinity and specificity for the RNA modification. And here you see a summary of what we found. So these were the key results by Lydia Contreras' lab, showing that all five mutants actually showed higher survivability to hydrogen peroxide exposure compared to the complemented wild type PNPAs. And PNPAs variants with enhanced adoxone affinity and selectivity differentially affect cellular tolerance to oxidative stress. And this observation provides a clear link between molecular discrimination of RNA oxidation and cell survival. To conclude, I would like to briefly say that in, in this field, it's important to be able to screen for the entire repertoire of RNA modifications. And this can be enabled through the topology parameters provided by MyGRL, as well as Syngen FF tool also provided by MyGRL's lab. Uh, we need an efficient and accurate, uh, we need efficient and accurate methods to simulate such systems. And we need atomistic detail, in my opinion, in these particular problems, because we're looking at subtle changes in, on the RNA into by introducing hydroxyl groups, methyl groups, et cetera. We need to be able to um, technically understand the, um, the comparison between one fits all approach to a custom based approach. So, in other words, in some cases, we may need to be able, we may need to, I mean, design the system computationally to be able to, to, to have the necessary detail we need. We need, for example, to carefully decide how we're going to score the energy between uh, protein and RNA. And we need to, we need to finally uh, understand what is the role of other nucleosides to the RNA modification and its binding to the protein. Last but not least, I want to highlight that um, what if, for example, the protein structure is not experimentally resolved? We have new methods, including, for example, AlphaFold and AlphaFold database, which now provides an excellent source for us to start looking at protein RNA complexes. Gita would like to highlight the importance of AlphaFold would predict, I mean, predicts a, a protein structure yet we need to find and we need to for example develop tools but i mean better tools to i would say highly accurate investigate the binding of rna to protein and then understand how the modified rna would bind to this protein thank you so much okay thank you both let's thank both speakers um we have a few minutes for questions so you can come up or use um slido for those I will start by asking um, both speakers maybe to share perspectives that they might have on how 
um, this understanding, especially with recognition of RNA modifications, might be incorporated into some of the technologies that we've heard about for detection. Then, if you you want to go through first, yes. yes. Okay, yeah, yeah use that. Danita, would you like to go first? Oh, um, um, I think um, you can go. You can go first. Thanks. So you said. Um, I mean, ideally, I mean, I would see, I mean, a potential avenue in the future uh, of us being able to, you know, wide understanding how RNA modifications bind to proteins and why, while we're understanding the problem better in terms of biophysics, to be able to, you know, uh, design proteins and modify proteins that can be able to detect uh, the, the presence of particular RNA modifications, I mean, that can be present uh, uh, in an assay. So computationally, one, I mean, one could see that, you know, we're just modeling a system. So we're solving what we are, what we're having in the system, but also we're having the capability to change what's on the RNA, what's on the protein and investigate different possibilities and this could potentially be integrated with other strategies, in my opinion. Excellent. Thanks. Danita? Um, I, I uh, completely agree with that. I think the uh, specificity of the um, RNA recognition limits application of some of the tools as broader um, um, broader tools for depositing and identifying sites of methylation. Certainly in the case of uh, mechanism-based cross-linking, very few enzymes go through covalent enzyme substrate intermediate that, that can be stabilized. And you know, other than uh, Yerne Ulis' work on 5-methyl-C and our work on RLM and CFR, this, uh, this methodology mechanistically is limited to those cases. So thinking more broadly about how we can expand this uh, beyond uh, mechanism directed ways is really um, a great point. Excellent. So we have a question from the room. Yes, this is uh, Glenn Borchardt. Um, so with uh, the PNP ISIS, this is for FAN. Um, I'm going to call you FAN. Um, do, uh, have you used that for RIPSeq? Have you, have you um, actually employed it to see if you can pull down um, in a eukaryotic system? No, we have just used, actually we have solved this we have used this as a model system to be able to st start, I would say, our journey into solving such problems. So uh, what, I what I showed in the last slides is a problem we are currently working with with Lydia, and uh, it's understanding rules of, uh, uh, RNA, uh, of um, readers in, in, in RNA recognition. For example, I, I, mean, I don't have it in the screen, is YTH. In, I mean, in, in complex with an RNA strand. So now we're in the process of <clears throat> derive, I, I would say, having computers deriving uh, RNA modifications which are prone to interact. And then in collaboration with Lydia's lab, uh, I mean, experimentally validating predictions. And also I would also like to highlight the importance of uh, in such projects is important for experiments. So in other words, uh, it's it's like we're uh, it's important to close the loop. For example, us providing insights to Lydia's lab and Lydia's lab providing insights to our lab so that we can uh, potentially improve the predictive ability of our tools as well. But to answer your question, no, but we have used this system primarily as a model system to st start developing the tool for, I would say, our new explorations in the field now, which are mostly focusing on reader uh, and, and readers and YTH proteins. Thanks. Excellent. Brenda. Uh, this is a question for Donica. And I'm, I'm thinking about uh, when you're using cryo-EM to detect modifications, you know, the, the auto pickers uh, are going to pick particles and I don't think they're going to be, they're going to be blind to the modification, I would suspect. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering what level of modification you need in your RNA sample. And that probably depends on resolution too. So if you could give me some of those uh, numbers. 
Yes, that is an excellent question. And uh, exactly the reason why we needed to do directed evolution on the uh, hypermethylating enzyme of the ribosome so that we can push from 25% of, of modifications that uh, uh, wild type enzyme has to near stoichiometric modification that we get with, uh, with uh, variant evolved in the presence of high amount of uh, antibiotics. So we have not compared variants of different uh, that, that methylate to different degree to uh, be able to very quantitatively address your question of, you know, by tracking one modification based on how much it's incorporated by the enzyme. But we did look into wild type uh, E. coli ribosome that has been, of course, very well characterized by other structural methods, crystallography, and as well as mass spectrometry for stoichiometry of modifications. And we can, uh, using CryEM and QPTMX tool, we can uh, um, call modifications uh, from well-resolved area of the, of the map and when they are, let's say, above 70 or 75% stoichiometry for lower percentage modifications or in poorly resolved re regions of the map, we are unable to do that. Oh, we got a follow-up. No, I just wanted to say thank you. <laughs> Excellent. Well, let's thank both of our speakers, um, and we'll move. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we're going to move to our next um, subsection about artificial intelligence. Um, so I'd like to introduce Raphael Townsend, uh, the founder and CEO of Atomic AI, which is a company that focuses on the structural elucidation of RNA molecules using artificial intelligence. Great. Thank you so much for the intro, uh, Julius. Let me share my screen now. Just want to confirm that uh, you can see this. Uh, it is almost, there we go. Great, fantastic. Well, thank you, first of all, so much for having me here today. It is my uh, pleasure to speak a little bit about uh, our past work and uh, around uh, AI and geometric deep learning specifically for uh, three-dimensional RNA structure. A lot of this presentation is going to be related to my previous uh, PhD work at Stanford that we are now also continuing here at Atomic AI. So, you know, very high level, just to set the stage, uh, we're talking here about specifically RNA tertiary structure prediction, uh, right? Going from a one-dimensional sequence to the three-dimensional shape adopted by these structures or the ensemble of confirmations in many cases instead. And really at, at the high level, there's this strong belief that 3D RNA structures sort of as highlighted by you know, Fan and others in previous uh, talks here that really enable and enhance mainly scientific and commercial use cases in human health, agriculture, synthetic biology and beyond. And while there's been some amazing progress made in terms of these experimental structure determination techniques, such as X-ray crystallography or CryUAM or NMR, they remain expensive in terms of cost and labor. And therefore, in practice, the vast majority of the structures across you know, the transcriptome and other sources remain in practice inaccessible to us. And therefore, sort of a lot of our guiding sort of work here is that the ability to accurately predict these three-dimensional structures has emerged as a need. And now for those of you following the protein world, and as has been alluded to as well here, there has been some major advances on that front through these alpha fold type technologies uh, that, uh, from uh, Google DeepMind specifically. And uh, you know, really what has happened is that there's been these highly accurate AI-driven predictions of 3D protein structure specifically. And a key advancement uh, that has really enabled a lot of this was really the reliance on large amounts of gold standard experimentally determined uh, protein structural data, as well as evolutionary type data. And so this has really been seen as a major breakthrough uh, roughly in 2021. Now, a major issue when we look at RNA instead is you know, really that there is really the severe lack of known RNA three-dimensional structures, and therefore standard alpha fold type models have ended up being insufficient for predicting you know, these kinds of structures. In particular, if we do a rough order of magnitude sort of comparison, um, 
You know, we're talking about on the order of a few hundred or thousands of RNA structures versus the hundreds of thousands of experimentally determined protein structures. And this has really led to the need in some ways for designing new and specialized uh, uh, computational algorithms to be able to accurately model these systems. So that is specifically what uh, we did starting with this work, um, which we called ARIES or the Atomic Rotational Equivariant Scorer, which was really a specialized deep learning algorithm that, was, that enabled us to yield sort of unprecedented structural accuracy. And specifically, some interesting salient points here is that ARIES itself was trained on 18 RNA structures in total, 18 uh, crystal structures to be specific. Uh, and I'll go into the details of that in a second. And through this sort of training algorithm, we were able to consistently win these international sort of blind competitions for uh, 3D RNA structure prediction in particular. Uh, you know, and to explain the ARIES method, for a second here. We essentially, it is known as a scoring network. It essentially consumes a structural model of an RNA, a candidate structural model, sort of a hypothesis for what the three-dimensional structure uh, would look like. And in particular, it, it looks at the individual atoms that comprise the structure, the atoms in three-dimensional space, essentially. And through multiple layers of deep learning, essentially, these graph neural network machine learning layers, essentially, it is able to learn a representation for each atom that encodes its neighboring three-dimensional environment. And then from there, these features are averaged across the entire structure, further layers of more standard machine learning algorithms are applied, and we end up with a final predicted deviation from the experimentally determined structure. Uh, in this case, we measured sort of predicted root mean square deviation from these structures. And what we find, and as I'll go into in a second, through these kinds of machine learning approaches, we are able to outperform more classic physics-based approaches at predicting three-dimensional RNA structure. And so one thing that we were very interested in measuring here was looking at essentially not just you know, retrospective sort of accuracy, but really looking at the ability of these kinds of deep learning networks to essentially generalize or make, you know, essentially de novo predictions instead. And so one key aspect that we started testing was this ability to generalize. And I mentioned this before, but ARIES was really trained at the end of the day on 18 small RNA molecules whose structures were published between 1994 and 2006. The average length was about 30 to 40 bases. And instead, we benchmarked ARIES on much larger RNA molecules that were published between 2010 and 2017, the average length being over 100 bases in this case. And the initial sort of finding that we came with was that ARIES was able to dramatically outperform, you know, state-of-the-art scoring functions in terms of picking out accurate structural models of RNA. And so what I am displaying here specifically is uh, really the comparison of ARIES as a scoring function to other sort of physics-based uh, scoring functions, including the Rosetta scoring function, as well as 3D RNA score. And in this case, each of these red crosses represents a specific RNA, specific case. And we are displaying overall 21 separate RNAs in this case. And what we can find is that for any given RNA, the top one ARIES prediction oftentimes falls below five angstroms RMSD, um, and in part, oftentimes actually below two angstroms RMSD. And when we compare that, for example, to Rosetta, which we can see in the bottom right here, in particular, a number of structures that Rosetta is able to predict at you know, a roughly 20 angstrom RMSD or 15 to 20, really ARIES is able to dramatically improve overall. And so, so far, all of this, to be absolutely clear, is purely a scoring uh, approach, right? We are working off of candidate structural models that have been generated by a separate sort of uh, physics-based sampling system. Now, the interesting question was whether, you know, if we combine these two and really assess the system as a whole, how that would perform. And so really the next logical step was to enter this, this combined approach into fully blind structure prediction challenges. And so, you know, you may be familiar with CASP and RNA puzzles being the RNA equivalent of CASP that has now been slowly merged into the CASP competitions. 
And you know, just to describe it briefly, when a structure is determined using experimental methods, the results are withheld. And then computational groups are asked to submit their predictions to a third party, which you know, only after the fact, you know, is then the assessment is released. And therefore we can sort of have this unbiased, uh, blind assessment of these computational methods. And we entered Aries into four rounds of this competition and found that on all four challenges, you know, Aries achieved a higher accuracy than all competitors. Uh, you know, just to highlight this again, you know, for one of these given RNAs, in this case, you know, RNA-A, which was actually puzzle 24, an adenovirus-associated RNA specifically in this case, we found that Aries was able to achieve about a 4.8 angstrom RMSD accuracy compared to the next best, in this case, Rosetta, at about 7.7 .7 angstroms. And the other interesting finding that we came from this was that there was no consistent second best method, including sort of structures that were generated by human experts in this case. Uh, now, uh, you know, I always, when giving these presentations, I'm told to start showing some more structures. So in the interest of, you know, really diving into that, we can actually look at specific uh, detailed tertiary motifs that are recovered by these kinds of algorithms. And what we can find is that uh, Aries is able to recover these tertiary motifs in a way that, um, you know, was not previously accessible to these kinds of uh, computational methods. And in particular, we find that we're able to find motifs such as intercalate T loops, base triplets, these loop into helix kind of motifs, effectively triple helices, or tightly packed helices overall. And the other interesting piece of this is that we find that Aries is also able to spontaneously recover key aspects of RNA structure. In particular, we found that we recovered the optimal distance between RNA strands for optimal base pairing, naturally, essentially de novo recovering the energy well that matches experimentally determined distances. But we also find that more broadly, Aries is able to uh, spontaneously recover, you know, the percentage of Watson-Crick base pairing in a given structural model, as well as the amount of hydrogen bonding per base. And so overall, we find that, you know, from this Aries method, this Aries method, we find that this geometric deep learning approach is able to achieve state-of-the-art results in predicting three-dimensional RNA structures. And this also actually interestingly represents a fairly interesting use case in machine learning as well, where essentially it, we were able to train and test these algorithms on a very limited amount of data, as well as spontaneously recovering key aspects of RNA structure formation. And while this has been some fairly exciting work for us specifically at this point, one thing that has become clear moving forward, right, is that this problem is far from solved at this stage. And there's really a need for additional experimental data at this point to continue training and improving upon these approaches at the end of the day. And that is really a lot of the work that we are doing here at Atomic AI today. Now, before you know, concluding this whole presentation, let me just give a few brief acknowledgements. These are mainly our collaborators from the days at Stanford, uh, you know, the, especially my advisor, Ron Dror and his group, as well as Riju Dasa, uh, um, providing a lot of the RNA structural expertise, the Rishi Condors lab, and Russ Altman and Nate Thomas. And just as a final sort of remark here, uh, just to highlight it for a second, really we find that these abundant structures, right, if we're able to get at this ability to predict RNA structures, can have really this broad impact across RNA drug discovery specifically, which is a lot of our internal focus here, including not only in enabling RNA targeting small molecules, but also around the uh, rational design, essentially, of various uh, RNA-based therapeutics in particular. You know, I'm talking about, you know, mRNA vaccines, for example, but also, um, you know, other systems such as gene therapy vectors, circular RNA, and, you know, other sort of uh, ASO, siRNA type approaches. And I think that's really where I'll leave it for you here today. Um, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Raphael. Great, we'll go to our next um, speaker, which is Mary McMahon, who is a director of biology at Revere Therapeutics, an early stage biotech startup focusing on RNA and AI technology development to reach disease targets previously considered undruggable. 
Great. Uh, thank you so much. And I'm delighted to join you today uh, to share some of our efforts in advancing RNA targeting small molecule drug discovery. So I hope you can see my slides here. Yep. Great. Thank you so much. So Revere Therapeutics is an early stage startup that is focused on RNA and AI technology development for the treatment of genetically defined disease. And um, we, since just starting our lab in uh, Shenzhen in China, we have our AI lab, and most of our research efforts are uh, conducted in um, South San Francisco, where I am located. We have been advancing three main platforms. Uh, this is our splicer platform, our uh, binder platform and our degrader platform. And just to kind of zoom in a little bit more on what we mean by this is we're really focusing on two main modalities to target RNA. One of them is a small molecule that can modulate RNA splicing and then regulate post-transcriptional gene expression. And the second is a uh, targeting structure. So we had a very nice introduction in the last talk about, you know, the different fold and structure that RNA can form. Here, our strategy is to find the small molecule that can bind a specific pocket within RNA and then regulate uh, post-transcriptionally uh, RNA expression and function. And at the center of our approach is uh, computational biology and AI capability for both of these uh, modalities. And um, what I'm going to tell you today is that we take a traditional computational approach to guide uh, hypothesis generation for both uh, target site identification and also for building our RNA focused compound libraries. And again, the, the AI comes into this in that uh, once we, we generate data, we can uh, repeat this cycle and we can actually really improve, um, you know, the target site uh, that can be the best target to drug. And also we open ourselves up to a very big chemical space uh, that can be more, you know, uh, tractable for targeting RNA. And, you know, again, just to kind of come back to the, the computational framework that we're using for our binder, we, this is really a 2D structure prediction that is guided by uh, chemical probing, such as shape map. And um, for our splicer, we're really uh, using a more of a sequence-based approach from in-house um, perturbation data of splicing to identify the best target site. So one of our approaches is really thinking about the target site for genetically defined disease, and then uh, really levering the AI to build um, the RNA focus library. And I think that this is uh, you know, uh, the area that I see uh, a lot of promise for our drug discovery effort. So I'm not a computational biologist, but in the short time that we have you know, uh, started the company and screened various target, you can really see the power of the AI to build the, the library and to increase uh, the hit rates and validate actually the target site. And for the splicer, this is really coming from rounds of screening data, or sorry, for the binder. And for the splicer, this is, you know, uh, virtual screening and computational aided uh, drug design library building. And at the center of our approach, we also have our Voyager server. And this is really um, a tool that allows us to compute and store the uh, target sites across the whole transcriptome. So this includes coding and non-coding RNA and uh, coding and non-coding regions. And we can integrate this into um, you know, a genome browser. And this is also curated with uh, public available, um, you know, human genetic data, but also we have a proprietary set of rare disease um, whole genome sequencing. And the goal here is really to identify and predict for us 
uh, potential functional sites within the, the transcriptome that can now be levered for drug discovery. And here is an example of our Voyager uh, server. And what you can see is within any region of the transcriptome, we can identify uh, our predict sites for our binder uh, platform here, such as some structure motif. We can also identify target for our splicer platform, including uh, a junction here where you see maybe a premature termination codon that would lead to nonsense mediated decay of this transcript. We also annotate, you know, um, clip data for RNA binding protein interaction. We also can uh, include here mRNA binding sites. And uh, we're also starting to integrate data on RNA modification. So, um, you know, for the, the splicer, what we're doing is using uh, junction data sets to really uh, identify the best target site um, for our uh, candidate. And uh, we really focus on the inclusion of uh, poison exons or exon skipping by alternative splicing. And then um, using AI deep learning models, we can predict these across transcriptome. We then validate these in cell using functional genomics, and we can uh, conduct uh, cell-based screening and uh, compound profiling. For the RNA structure uh, pipeline, we take a different approach. We uh, can take the sequence of the RNA and then we uh, predict structure. Again, this is mostly 2D-based structure prediction, uh, taking into consideration the local and global uh, thermal stability of the structure. Um, we also consider covariation analysis for structure function relationship. We uh, confirm or redefine, uh, refine the structure using a chemical probing methods such as shape map. And then this leads us to a hypothesis generator um, in combination with functional genomics where we can validate uh, the function of this target site. And now I just want to share with you an example from both our binder and splicer platform where we validate a target site and we show an example of a hit confirmation. So here's an example of a non-coding RNA target that uh, we predicted a very stable structure. So this was a multi-way uh, junction. And interestingly, human genetic data told us that this is an important functional region on this non-coding RNA because mutations in that domain are causative uh, for several diseases. Uh, we then um, can confirm the, the structure using a uh, shape map and um, this 2D structure. And we submitted this uh, region for our biophysical screen. So we perform a number of uh, biophysical screening approaches for our target binder. And um, once we obtain a hit from the screen, we can confirm that the, the compound, the small molecule, these are all drug-like small molecule, that uh, we can identify using shape map the potential binding site or the change in structure uh, that is occurring upon compound binding. And here you can see that there's a nice dose response between the alteration in the structure and the compound concentration. We can also confirm using a number of biophysical methods such as um, ITC and SPR that the compound uh, can bind the structure. We also confirm with KIMCLIP in-cell interaction of the small molecule and the um, RNA target. And then here in this case, we also see functional activity. So the region uh, that we targeted is important for a ribonucleoprotein complex formation. And uh, the RNA protein that binds this region is important for stability of the transcript. And here you can see in cell, we see a dose response 
uh, inhibition of the target. So the binder is inducing degradation of the target in cell. Um, another example from our splicer platform, we identified using our computational approaches, um, a putative site that uh, when modulated by small molecule should induce the inclusion of a poison exon and activate degradation of the RNA by nonsense mediated decay. We can then create um, a cell screening tool to, to modulate, uh, to monitor the activity of this site. And we use this using a splicing light up mini gene reporter. And um, we can perform screens with thousands of molecule and identify a, a hit. And in this example, we can confirm for a neurological disease target that in cell, the small molecule can modulate splicing of the target site. So it includes, um, it's, the small molecule is inducing the inclusion of this exon. Um, it is leading to a decrease in the total RNA for this transcript by nonsense mediated decay uh, degradation. And then we also see a decrease in the target protein expression upon small molecule uh, treatment. So this nicely uh, validate using the binder and splicer, our target site identification, but also our hit confirmation. And what we're very excited for uh, moving forward is utilizing both for our binder and splicer platform, AI to basically increase uh, the hit rate, but also to um, broaden and expand the chemical space that can target RNA. And um, here is an example of how we have used um, this approach. So we can perform our biophysical screen with say a specific RNA structure. We can identify a small molecule that are specific and selective for the structure. And you can see here the hit rate is quite low. So this is a diversity library of 14,000 compounds that our RNA target is screened against. And the, we can then use both the positive molecule and the negative, so the molecule that bounds and the molecule that does not bind. And we can feed this into um, machine learning model to predict you know, uh, compounds from broader library that may bind. And for here, for example, you can see some of the input for the model include um, chemical you know, fragment descriptors. Um, we can then, we went to a commercial library of 300,000 compounds and we predicted uh, based on the training data, both the positive and negative, um, compounds that would not bind that we call uh, negative. And we, we selected 1,000 of these. And then we selected compounds that we predict uh, should bind. And here we um, selected 3,500 compounds. And um, what we found was from the compounds we didn't expect to bind, um, we redid our screen with all of these compounds. We find that the, the negative uh, compounds, again, they did not bind in the screen. Whereas the, the pool of compounds that we predict now might be a binder, uh, we actually could find a lot of uh, binders. And we found that the AI generated hit rate almost increase the hit rate by tenfold. So we're very excited um, moving forward to applying these um, models, not only for um, small molecule that can bind structure, but also for small molecule that can modulate uh, splicing. And uh, just to summarize, you know, this is really helping us advance our drug discovery workflow in going from our target identification to identifying uh, the small molecule that combined RNA. And I think the key here uh, for RNA targeting and even thinking about applying to RNA modification is the chemical space that uh, we can use and explore uh, that will be tractable for RNA. And uh, just to thank you for your attention and again, the opportunity to share our efforts with you today and there's a lot of people to thank um, from our team 
at our both sites in San Francisco and in Shenzhen. And I look forward to discussion. Thank you, Mary. Let's thank both of our speakers. Um, we're running a little low on time, but we have time for a couple of questions. And I'm going to start one that summarizes some of the what's in Slido. Um, uh, for Raphael, um, you know, you mentioned needing more data for AI prediction. We're obviously thinking a lot about RNA modifications and how AI might be used to predict those or make sense of some of the data we're we're uh, getting. Um, and one of your key part of your approach, though, is to come up with candidate models. And we still have a lot of uncertainty in how RNA modifications affect, you know, basic secondary structure predictions and which might, you know, cascade and generate generation of those candidates. So I wonder if you could comment on the needs there. Yes, uh, and I certainly agree. There is a strong need for, you know, data around these modifications and their impact on structure. I mean, AI is a tool at the end of the day, and it's only going to be as good as the data that you feed into it in the first place. Um, you know, to briefly comment on this, on the ARIES model, you know, if you're at Atomic, we've actually gone beyond this at this point and sort of removed the need for, you know, a separate uh, sampling step, essentially. And it's uh, much more end to end at this point would be the simple way of putting it, going from sequence to an ensemble of confirmations specifically to address issues like that, where you're reliant on, if you're reliant on a separate sampling step, essentially, if that sampler is unable to sample the correct confirmations or really understand chemical modifications, um, then that will be sort of insufficient in of itself. Thank you. All right, we have a question from Brenda. Uh, I, I think this will start with Raphael. Uh, Mary might have something to say about it, but I'm thinking uh, if I understood correctly, your uh, training structures were mostly crystallography, crystal structures. And so uh, there are, you know, sometimes very non-physiological conditions in those crystal structures. And I'm wondering if any of your AI methods take into account you know, uh, you know, if you if you want to know the structure in the cell, is uh, can you take that into account? Yeah, um, the short answer is yes. At this point, uh, you know, I would say that is definitely a major uh, sort of area of active research. Is the first thing I'll say. But you know, being able to model the you know the structure across different cellular contexts in the presence of proteins, right? Overall protein RNA complexes um, and other sort of conditions more generally is really a key need and one that you can build into these algorithms and that we already are. Great, great. Thank you. Excellent. Kristen. My question is really similar to the question that Brenda just asked, um, and that has to do with how do you think about the conformational heterogeneity of RNAs? Because like Brenda mentioned, a lot of times in a crystal structure, we get one structure, but I'm thinking of a recent example um, in the riboswitch world, right? Riboswitches should be relatively well-structured RNAs, and you would think these would be great training structures, but um, you know, there's a cobalamin riboswitch that was crystallized. And then last month, um, some AFM data came out of NIH that showed that there's actually 10 different confirmations of this riboswitch. How do you, when you're training data sets, how do you think about the fact that RNA is inherently dynamic? Um, I mean, by the way, I think what you're doing is great and absolutely important, but just in terms of figuring out what the real right answer is, how, how, how are you going about validating that? Mary, do you want to take this one first? <laughs> yeah, thank you. Um, so, you know, I think here the key for the, the, the structure, of course, we know there's a lot of confirmation. And um, from the perspective of, I guess, the therapeutic would be which one is the most disease relevant. But from the basic biology point of view and, you know, how do you get to the confirmation? And even from 2D, you know, with using the shape map chemical probing, you see a lot of heterogeneity, right? Even in different cell type, um, in cell. And I think the, the main question there is the single molecule structure resolution. And, you know, even, you know, advances with nanopore, for example, this is something that is, you know, uh, we heard yesterday how it's been used for RNA 
but also thinking of using nanopore for single molecule resolution of RNA structure at that um, 2D uh, resolution. But in terms of the 3D, I think the, the resolution is really important. So for us, it's more once we have a molecule that we're confident is binding, then we take the 3D approach to uh, confirm structure, investigate further. But I guess, um, you know, the more method we can develop to really think about single molecule and resolve those uh, different confirmation, um, I think that there's work there to be done. I'm going to move on. Nick, do you have a question? Yeah, quick question. For... I can email them if that's... No, you could, yeah, we got time for one quick more question by Nick. Okay. So uh, it's building off of the questions that we've just asked, but it just, it, I had, it occurred to me that, that these, in the training data, you don't know what you're missing, right? It's just unknown. Um, however, your models are likely failing because of, and, and I'm not, I'm, I'm not accused, I'm, I'm not saying that they are, if they fail, <laughs> they're failing because of lack of sufficient training coverage, right? But what that provides potentially, and I want to get your like input on this, if your model is failing in a particular area or with a particular part of the sequence, and you can document that, does that give us some insights into where we might be looking in collecting new data? In other words, can we use the failures of your AI models to predict where we might need to be looking and doing more research and collecting more data? I mean, to answer that shortly, uh, yes. Um, what's very interesting is these machine learning models can output not only a prediction, but also a confidence in the prediction in the first place, which is actually quite interesting in of itself. And so there's this sort of framework, essentially, and this is a little bit of what we're building here at Atomic, known as active learning in some ways, which is really you're letting the model sort of uncertainty on certain places guide where you're running the next experiment such that you know, the experiments are almost like designed to maximally reinforce the AI's predictions, but also helps guide you towards where there might be some very interesting um, novel biology because it's not uh, predictable and was not previously known. So long and winded answer, but, uh, you know, really, yes, at the end of the day, you can get those, you can get those confidence measures and, find, and really hone in on those low confidence regions. And that's a very interesting approach overall. Let's thank Mary and Raphael again. Okay, our last uh, subsection here focuses on cryo EM. Um, Professor Via was not able to be with us today, so we have uh, Jeffrey Kieft, uh, who is Vice Department Chair, um, Director of the Structural Biology and Biophysics Core Facility, and a Director of the RNA Society at the University of Colorado School of Medicine. Um, in May, he will become the Executive Director of the New York Structural Biology Center. Jeff's research focuses on understanding how RNA structure, RNA conformational changes, and complex intermolecular interactions combine to enable diverse RNA function. Okay, great. Can everyone hear me? Sounds great. All slides right, are... hopefully you can see the slides. All right, well, thank you. It's, a, I guess, an honor to be the last speaker, uh, maybe a dubious honor, but no, seriously, it's really great to be invited to be a part of this workshop. I've learned a lot. It's been really interesting. Um, and as you just heard, I'm currently at the University of Colorado, and in May, I'm going to be uh, moving to New York City. So uh, I'll just frame the, my, my presentation by, um, by giving you a, a one slide about what my lab has been interested in, in for the last couple decades. We're really interested in the role that RNA plays in, in viral disease. 75% uh, of the viruses that are known to cause human disease have RNA genomes. Those that do not have RNA genomes, of course, are still using RNA within the viral life cycle. And these viral RNAs really are littered with interesting sequences or interesting structural elements that control all these different um, events that have to occur for successful viral infection. And so we're really interested in studying these, not only to understand how the viruses infect the cell and how they cause disease, but also um, the structures that RNA is capable of, of forming and, 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 and really how RNA structure um, produces a very specific biological function. So we, we play with uh, viral RNAs, but really I'm interested in RNA structure and how that drives function in general. Now, traditionally over the years, my lab has used 
X-ray crystallography is our primary tool of structural determination. We combine that with biochemistry, virology, and biophysics. Um, but we really, you know, we, 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 we've gotten to the point now where we can often fairly reliably solve the structures of RNA, um, folded RNAs using X-ray crystallography. But of course, it is a fairly limited technique in that some RNAs are just not crystallizable um, or, or they're not amenable to the technique. And so most, more recently, my lab has turned to cryo-EM, um, trying to see if we could use cryo-EM uh, as a robust and reliable way to obtain structural information on viral RNAs, um, especially at a size in which we normally don't think of cryo-EM as being a robust or reliable technique. Um, and so I'm going to talk a little bit about that today, but I do want to, of course, this is, this is a workshop on post-transcriptional modifications. So I'm going to start actually with, you know, posing a, a very maybe simple question. You know, could we use cryo-EM, single particle cryo-EM, to directly visualize post-transcriptional modifications in RNA? Um, and I'll start with a case study, which is, is, is I guess, kind of builds on one of the talks uh, earlier this morning, which is looking at uh, a ribosome. So a non-viral RNA project in my lab, uh, through collaboration with the Ristland lab, we've become interested in the molecular biology of Giardia. And as part of that, we decided to solve the structure of the Giardia ADS ribosome using cryo-EM. Um, a few years ago, we put up a preprint where we had a preliminary angst four angstrom structure. Uh, and you're welcome to look at that on BioArchive. Um, not too long after, uh, the Yonath lab published a 2.75 angstrom structure, so much better than our four angstrom structure. And now we have a structure right around 2.5 angstroms that we are preparing for publication. And I wanna use this as a case study just to show you, um, well, what we learned from, from really these, these three complementary structures of essentially the same target. So the, as you can see here, you know, the resolution is really quite good this, in this heat map of, of, the, of the resolution. You know, we're, we're hovering right around 2.5 angstroms global resolution. But of course, in the core of the, of, the, of the ribosome, if you kind of slice through it here and you look in the core of the 60S, you can see there's parts where we're approaching 1.5 to 2 angstrom resolution. So really a, a nice high quality structure that we could look at. Now, interestingly, um, when the Yodath lab uh, published their uh, 2.75 angstrom structure, um, they proposed uh, sites where they observed post-transcriptional modifications. And this is interesting because Giardia is a relatively understudied organism, unlike E. coli or many other um, organisms for which the ribosome has been studied structurally for a long time and there's a lot of information about it. We don't know ab initio where there are post-transcriptional modifications within the Giardia uh, RNAs or Giardia ribosomal RNAs. Uh, but the Yonath lab proposed that they could see these modifications and they provided a table saying this is where we think we see post-transcriptional modifications. Now, because we had a higher resolution structure, we could go back and we could look at it and say, does our map show the same thing? And in some cases it did, and in some cases it didn't. So the 0.25 or so angstrom better resolution that we got allowed us to see that in, in fact, some of these features in the map that looked like methylation sites were in fact uh, bound water molecules. So we could now distinguish the water molecule from what would be a methyl. In other places, uh, it looked good. Our, our density or our, our maps, I'm sorry, con contained features that were consistent with the modification that they proposed. And other places it was ambiguous and other places we were pretty confident looking at our maps, we didn't see anything there that looked like a modification. Um, so this is, I guess, a, both a cautionary tale and, op and, a, and, a, and a cause for optimism. The optimistic side, is that yes, we could clearly see in our map some of the same features they saw for some of these distinctive modifications, especially when the nucleotides that we're looking at were in the core of the ribosome where you're talking about 1.5 to two angstrom uh, resolution maps. Um, but in other places, it was clear that um, they had been misled. Um, and so that's perhaps a bit of a cautionary tale that you know 2.75 angstrom sounds good, um, but in many cases, it may not be good enough to see the modifications or confidently assign them. So I think there's hope, cause for optimism, or also some cause for, um, for care. So this, I, I don't show this to, um, to bash the, 
the Yonath lab in any way, but just to say this kind of maybe impinges on the question of structure, or I'm sorry, of standards and, and best practices. What resolution is good enough? When do we see something in a map that we can confidently say that's a modification? How good does the resolution have to be? How good does the map have to be? And how do we integrate orthogonal techniques? So as a mapping technique of novel modifications, CryoEM is probably not yet robust in terms of the standards and the practices that are already in place. Um, but now I want to turn to away from ribosomes because you know we know ribosomes have modifications. We're pretty good at studying them. We know we can get ribosome structures to high resolution. What about other RNAs? RNAs that are maybe not complex with proteins, RNAs similar to the ones that we're talking about that might be embedded in messenger RNAs or might be non-coding RNAs that are produced by the cell. Well, as a test case, um, I'll talk about the tetrahymena thermophila group one intron. So this is a self-cleaving, self-splicing ribozyme, um, which was discovered decades ago and is heavily studied structurally, biochemically, and biophysically. So my lab, um, in addition with um, Wachu's lab and Riju Das's lab, have been playing around with this RNA to see what one could do with it and, and use it as kind of a test case for cryoEM studies of RNA. And so we've been able to obtain a 2.44 angstrom map of this RNA. This is in vitro transcribed RNA, so it does not come from the cell. It's not going to have any post-transcriptional modifications. But you can see, again, there are parts uh, overall, the, 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 the resolution is 2.4 or so. Within the, the folded core of the ribosome, there are regions that are hovering right around two angstroms, so very good resolution. And you can see in the maps, we're starting to approach the sort of um, resolution or detail that one might hope would yield um, visualization of post-transcriptional modifications. Um, probably we're right about at the edge. And again, it's gonna be mostly in the core, not in these peripheral regions where the maps are going to be that good. So I think this is an important point to bring up is that, you know, um, different parts of cryoEM maps are going to have different quality, different resolution. And so one might be able to um, visualize or assign post-transcriptional modifications in some parts of the map. But if those modifications are on the peripheral or the exterior of the molecule, or maybe they're being recognized by proteins or involved in interactions, they're going to be much harder to see because those are the most mobile parts where in general we get um, the lower resolution. But um, again, the tetrahymena group one intron is some, a somewhat specialized case. It's a very stably folded and well-behaved RNA for structural studies. What about something that's maybe a little bit more um, typical of an RNA that one might want to study? So this test case I'll show you is a tRNA mimicking viral RNA element. Uh, it's about 55 kilodaltons, so smallish for traditional cryoEM, but certainly within the realm of what people are doing now. Um, and I won't go into the, the, the virology here, but this is the secondary structure. Um, it's found on the three prime end of certain viral um, genomes, and it's involved in various aspects of the, of, the, of the viral infection cycle. So we were able to solve this RNA-only molecule uh, using cryoEM, and this, this has been published. Um, but the, the best resolution we could get was somewhere between four to 4.6 angstroms. Um, and in, that's good enough to see the bumps corresponding to the, the, the phosphates of the backbone. It's good when used, good enough when using various density modified and sharpening techniques to start to build models. And we were in fact able to build a complete structural model of this 55 kilodalton um, RNA. But if you look at the, the maps over here, you can see there isn't nearly the amount of detail that one would need to place or to observe post-transcriptional modifications. And again, I'll point out this was in vitro transcribed RNA, so we don't expect to see any modifications, but there is evidence in the literature that this viral RNA does receive some modifications as perhaps part of its tRNA mimicking behavior. Um, and if that were true, we would have been unable to validate that in the, in the maps, even if we had had uh, RNA that was actually you know, authentic from an authentic viral infection. So again, and, 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 I, and I'll just say, I think this is probably the resolution that, that where we're really pushing what's, what's possible for most RNAs. And, and the other the thing I'll also say is that part of the reason that we were limited here was because of what's already been mentioned, dynamic 
conformational changes within the RNA. And that probably limited our resolution um, to a great degree. All right, so the last thing I'll say is a technique that we're, that we're developing my lab to try and see, okay, can we, can we solve RNA structures by cryolium routinely? Part of the problem is that RNA structures tend to be off, often the domain that you're interested in studying, the folded domain is fairly small, um, 30, 20 kilodaltons in size. That's still really difficult to get reasonable maps by cryo-EM. So our idea is to append smaller RNA domains that we're interested in studying um, onto the group one intron, which I showed you is very amenable to cryo-EM. We build these, or we in vitro transcribe these chimeric molecules, put them through the process, and hope to be able to recover maps very quickly. So the idea is we take the group one intron, we circularly permutate it, we append RNAs of interest, and you hope to get a map like this, where your RNA of interest is now displayed on this larger RNA scaffold. Um, long story short, this works. So here's an example of the group one intron with this exonuclease resistant RNA from Zika appended to it. And you can very clearly see in the maps, there's the RNA that we appended. You can also see that the resolution is not spectacular. In fact, we were able to get this to about five angstrom resolution, which was good enough to build an initial model, which fairly well recapitulates the crystal structure. So I failed to say that we, we use this as a test case because we already knew this, the structure of this RNA from our crystallography studies. And so we were, we were pleased to see that we could essentially recover a very similar structure using cryo-EM to what we had seen by crystallography. And we've applied this now to a few other RNAs and we can pretty routinely get now um, maps at about 4.5 to five angstrom resolution, even with RNAs that are smaller than 20 kilodaltons. So this is not high resolution. Um, it's not truly high throughput, but I'll point out that, you know, we went from essentially making the RNA to having initial maps for these RNAs in, in less than a week. So one can then, one can see the global architecture, perhaps get initial models of RNAs um, at mid-resolution uh, fairly rapidly. Okay, so I'll, I'll just finish there because I know we're at the very end of this workshop and I'm sure people are tired. Um, you know, I think Cryo-EM has, has clearly, can you can see post-transcriptional modifications. That's not surprising, but it's going to be somewhat slow. It's not going to be routine for every RNA. It's probably limited to RNAs that are, in fact, well-folded. The more dynamic the more RNA, the more difficult it's going to be. Uh, that's a characteristic of RNA that presents challenge. And so far, you know, we've really only done it on in vitro transcribed unmodified RNAs, with the exception of, you know, ribosomal RNAs and, and one could apply it certainly to tRNAs. Um, you know, we need, to, we need to decide if we're going to really use cryo-EM to, to map or to observe putative modifications. What's the gold standard for resolution? How good does it have to be before it ends up in a database? And what do different modifications look like in a cryo-EM map? I was really pleased to see um, Denitza talk about um, um, automated methods for perhaps um, interpreting cryo-EM maps. I think that's really important. And then, you know, what techniques do we trust? What orthogonal techniques are going to be required to really make sure that something we see in a cryo-EM map is authentic? Is that mass spec? Is it recognition by an antibody? Is it some combination of those? I think orthogonal techniques will always be need, needed when you're using uh, structural biology methods. And so in the future, you know, maybe we can expand the use of scaffolds or other molecules to display RNAs that might be modified. I think the artificial intelligence and the automated analysis are going to be really important. You know, we're going to have to think about if we want to study post-transcriptional modifications of RNAs, we're going to have to get the RNAs out of the cells where they're produced. We can't use in vitro transcribed RNAs. So if you're talking about a particular motif in a particular 5' prime UTR of a particular mRNA that you want to study, how are you going to get enough of that that is modified at a high enough level that you can put it on a cryo-EM grid and actually do structural biology. And I think that alludes to some a question Kristen asked a little bit um, earlier. Um, and I also think it's going to be important maybe to have more than one structure. So, you know, we were able to compare our structure to the structure from the Yonath lab, and that gave additional insight into where modifications were, were likely occurring and where they were unlikely to occur. And so, you know, that gets back to the standards. How much do you need to see before you really trust what your, what your eyes are showing you? 
Okay, I will finish there. Uh, and I'll just thank the people in my lab who worked on this particular project who are highlighted in yellow, all the support and the funding that we got, and I'm eager to uh, see what questions emerge. So thank you. Thank you, Jeff. Let's thank Jeff. So we are close to time, but I think I'll ask one, Jeff, I appreciate the future perspectives you gave at the end, but to follow up on one point, this concept of scaffolds and wanting to work on obviously native RNAs, do you envision a way to combine those approaches to, you know, capture native RNAs and lock them down so that cryoEM can be applied? Yeah, I'll admit I have not thought about that too much, but I think that's an interesting question, right? So, you know, perhaps you could get to a point where if there was a specific RNA structural motif in the cell that you were confident was getting a post-transcriptional modification you were interested in, and you were confident that um, the signal that triggers the modification were, con was contained in that motif. Maybe you could append that motif onto another RNA that's being expressed in the cell. It would get modified and pull it out. But of course, there's a lot of ifs there, right? And so um, that's where I think, yeah, there, there just needs to be a lot of basic groundwork about what's driving the modification in a certain location, what's the stoichiometry, um, yeah. Excellent. Well, in the interest of time and the needs to wrap our workshop up, let's thank all of our speakers in this session. That was really fantastic. I'm just going to thank uh, all of you uh, that have participated in person and online and all of the speakers. Um, uh, I so appreciate how actively everybody participated. Uh, this is hugely and uh, helpful to the Academy's committee that has to evaluate this task. And I know I've I've learned a huge amount, and I've also learned uh, what I don't know. So uh, give yourself a hand, please. <laughs> And then just to uh, uh, thank you so much to the Academy's uh, staff and um, our AV people back there. Everything has been really great. So let's. You know, we'll